are recording and you are good to go. Hello and welcome to the ninth NOAA HAB seasonal forecast for Lake Erie. Um, my name is Chris Winslow and I'm director of both the NOAA supported Ohio Sea Grant program and Ohio State University's Stone Lab. Um, I'm, we'll start uh, before jumping into our speakers just by first uh, quickly running through some WebEx features, but then also we will lay out some logistics for today's virtual meeting, and then I will introduce a few dignitaries that we have with us uh, today before we hop into, again, our, our loadings and our, our forecast and the other speakers. Um, in addition to those uh, dignitaries that will say a few words here in a couple minutes, I want to recognize that if you look at the registration for this event, um, we have numerous elected official, officials that RSVP. We have numerous representatives from the state house and the state senate, and both the federal house and the, and the federal senate. So it's just a, a amazing attendance um, from that perspective. Further, I just want to acknowledge we have tremendous amount of state agency leadership, not just from Ohio, but also from neighboring states, and a tremendous number of um, state agency staffs represented. So it's been a phenomenal turnout. Um, I'm walk, watching the attendee number go up and up and up. We're already uh, over 300 attendees um, right now. So as far as the WebEx features that I want to run through, all registered attendees um, will be muted throughout the webinar. You will be able to ask questions of our speakers via the chat function. So if you move your mouse to the bottom of the screen, you will see a, a little thought bubble or a speaking bubble. Um, if you click um, on that, there will be a chat window that shows up in the right-hand side of your screen. I would encourage you just to write um, your questions within that chat function. The staff in, in this office will monitor that chat box and will help me facilitate the asking of these questions to our speakers. Um, actually, I've got a correction now. If you put that chat function rather than to all participants, so you can choose at that bottom chat function, uh, send it to the name you'll see as Jill Gentis. So that's, uh, that's a great way to go about that. Um, today's speakers will be heard but not seen. So because none of our speakers are coming to us virtually, we wanted to make sure we didn't have bandwidth issues for this very important virtual forecast. So the today's speakers, you will hear their voices, um, but you will not see them um, using their videos. That said, we will provide throughout the Q&A sessions a headshot slide that will have a picture of all your speakers, so you can put a, a name and a face together. Um, and it'll also have the contact information um, for those uh, Q&A opportunities. Um, so after, again, uh, we go through the, 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 the words that we're going to hear from our dignitaries, um, we're going to go into the mommy loading and the, the bloom forecast. So those are our first two presentations. It's going to be Dr. Laura Johnson and Rick Stump, respectively. After those two presentations, we are going to open up um, the audio lines for media outlets that have joined the webinar today. So we wanted, um, uh, per, per Noah's request, we wanted the media outlets to be able to ask Laura Johnson and Rick Stump questions uh, through their audio capabilities. Um, while this is happening, the registered attendees, those that are not affiliated with these media outlets, will be able to ask questions through the chat function. So again, we're going to go into uh, Dr. Laura Johnson's uh, nutrient, mommy river loading information, Rick Stump's forecast. We will then take Q&A audibly for the media folks and through the chat function from all registered attendees. Um, and so then after that Q&A, we will jump into the remaining speakers. So we have four speakers for you today um, that will give talks um, about different topics, and, and I'll in introduce those as we move through uh, the agenda today. Um, you can be typing in questions during their, their presentations, but we are going to wait till the end of all four of those presentations to actually address those chat questions. Um, and so that's the way that's going to happen. For the media that were invited um, to participate in this virtual webinar, um, during that Q&A, we will not be toggling you on to do voice questions. So all attendees, media and um, RSVP individuals, We'll be doing all the Q&A for our final speakers through the, through the chat function. Okay, um, so basically what I'd like to do now, it is, it is absolutely my pleasure to first introduce Congresswoman Debbie Dingell um, that has joined us today. So, so the staff are going to um, unmute the Congresswoman's mic and so she can uh, address the virtual attendees. Thank you, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, for being with us today. 
inviting me to be with you at this very important event uh, where you're going to be announcing the 2020 harmful algae bloom forecast for Lake Erie. I know you're going to hear Bob Lotta, my dear friend and colleague from Ohio, is going to be on, and that Marcy, my co-chair of the Great Lakes, has cut a video for you. So, um, you know, my district is shares and has been very close for uh, many years to Ohio, and we all deeply care about the Great Lakes and uh, the Detroit River and Lake Erie. Lake Erie and the entire Great Lakes Basin are important resources that we've got to protect for all future generations. Clean, safe water is essential to the Great Lakes' vital role in supporting tourism, commercial, and recreational fishing, agriculture, and manufacturing. This morning I was having, this is off subject a little, but people don't understand what a resource our Great Lakes. I was doing a media kind of just round table briefing and someone asked me what the difference was between the sea and the Great Lakes and why do people always talk about this water? And I said, do you understand that the Great Lakes are 20% of the fresh water that is on in the world and how important it is to protect these fresh waters? Uh, so I, I just, I think we can never tell our story enough. The Great Lakes bind our region across eight states, two provinces, and two countries. And they provide drinking water for 50 million people, which was another factoid that they did not know this morning. Harmful algae blooms, as you know, pose significant threats to human health, the uh, environment, and the economy. Uh, Marcy uh, and I always talk about, while early projections show the 2020 bloom in Lake Erie may be smaller than last year, the risks are just always there and they remain high. And with lake levels rising, the waters have never been higher. And the temperatures warming due to climate change, these risks aren't going away. They're gonna endure into the future. So we can't afford to let harmful algae blooms continue to go unchecked. To make the necessary progress towards understanding and addressing the significant and expanding threats that these harmful algae blooms pose to human health and our economy, we must prioritize a strong and coordinated federal response and robust funding for all the work related to the harmful algae blooms, including the good work that NOAA and all of its partners here today are engaged in to produce these critical annual forecasts. And it's vitally important the work continue. We are all, all of us, Democrats and Republicans fighting to ensure for the needed federal investment in science research and management to increase our capacity to forecast, detect, and prevent harmful blooms, LGL blooms across the Great Lakes. That also means increasing funding for these federal agencies and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Yesterday, the Appropriations Committee, subcommittee, was considering this, and uh, we had lobbied hard for an increase, and yesterday we got at the subcommittee level, and we're hopeful we can increase the GLRI federal funding to $335 million for fiscal year 2021, which will help us go a long way in combating this. So as co-chair of the Great Lakes Task Force with Marcy Kapter, protecting water quality and the Great Lakes, it rises above partnership in Congress. This is about protecting one of the most essential natural resources in the world and providing clean water for future generations. So I really, really want to thank and commend NOAA, Ohio Sea Grant, and all the federal partners and the academic research institutes institutions that are leading on this issue, and I'm proud to join you today for this important conference and announcement. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Congresswoman Dingle, for all the efforts that, that you've poured, put towards not only Lake Erie, but the Great Lakes in their entirety. Uh, uh, thank you for those, those kind, kind words. No, thank you, guys. You're the workers. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, next, we'll turn to Congressman uh, Bob Lada. So we'll see. Let me see what he's unmuted. So, Congressman Lada.
Well, good morning. How are you all today? Fantastic, Congressman. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks very much. And uh, thanks very much for having us on this morning. And it's good to hear from my good friend, uh, Debbie Dingle. Uh, we've worked on a lot of different uh, issues together. And uh, none is as important as when we're talking about our Great Lake. And especially when I talk about our Great Lake, it's Lake Erie. And uh, it's so important that uh, you're all assembled today. Uh, and I also want to really thank uh, NOAA and Ohio State Sea Grant and all the other partners who've made this happen. You know, when you uh, think back uh, how important it is for Lake Curie, I know I, the economic impact that was uh, that was released uh, showing just uh, about $2.1 billion in, in 2018 numbers, and that those numbers keep going up when you just think about tourism alone. And then you throw in the fishing, the hunting, the, and you, you name it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a huge uh, impact on our economy. But, but more importantly, it's the water and the water quality, as Debbie pointed out, that uh, you know, the, the number of communities that uh, draw water from the lake uh, that uh, make sure that they uh, have the ability to, re to keep those communities. If you didn't have that water, you wouldn't have a community. And uh, I've been going to uh, Lake Erie my, at literally my entire life. It's a place my wife and I and our kids, when they were younger, we always wanted to go to. But uh, it's important that we, we make sure that we have um, uh, that lake and it's, and, it's, and it's clean. And especially when we're dealing with the uh, harmful algal bloom issues. You know, I'll never forget back in 2014, we were in session and I got off the plane. It was after a late uh, Friday night boat and I got into Detroit about seven o'clock in the morning and found out what had happened and what is going on in Toledo and what, you know, what ended up having a half a million people uh, being shut off from their water supply. And uh, so, you know, I've been, even before then, I've been consistent that we want to make sure, especially with the GLRI, that uh, we're there to protect and preserve the lake. But uh, as we remember on that, in, back in 2014, I'll never forget that the first call I made was to Ohio State Sea Grant, literally, and uh, talked with Jeff for, uh, I think, the entire way from Detroit to Bowling Green and everything that uh, had been gleaned at that point. And, you know, and then over the course of the next four days, I think it was, uh, you know, there was great cooperation from the federal, state, and local. And I know that I was on calls uh, with uh, everybody from the Ohio Department of Agriculture, the Ohio EPA, uh, Division, uh, Department of Natural Resources, and you know, with, with our federal counterparts to move forward with that. Because again, we have a half a million people that could not uh, access water, it was critical. And it was after that uh, situation that we had that I uh, introduced the Drinking Water Protection Act, which directed the EPA, US EPA, to develop that strategic plan for assessing and managing risks associated with algal, algal toxins in public drinking water. And I know that in follow-up meetings that we've had, and I tell you, we had great cooperation on the, on the federal side on the drinking water, because I know that um, uh, we, the testimony that we had in, in our Committee on Energy and Commerce that uh, EPA was right there to respond to the questions that we had and they were there. So I appreciated that. But, uh, you know, the EPA has said that, you know, our legislation has made a difference in how communities are out there responding to algal bloom issues to ensure that people can be confident in the water that they're drinking. And uh, so every year, and I do mean every year and during the course of the year, I uh, closely monitor as well as my staff, uh, the uh, harmful algal bloom forecasts that come out. And because we always are there uh, ready to work with our local state and federal officials in the event we have another problem. And, but, uh, and we all know this, that Lake Erie is our crown jewel of our, air, of our area and our region. So it's imperative that we all work together to make sure that uh, the, the lake is in a good, healthy condition, and we have to take the necessary actions uh, to make sure that happens. So I just want to thank you all again for, for being here today. Uh, your information that you provide is absolutely essential. It's not only followed by the folks around this area, 
but not only around the country, but around the globe. So I greatly appreciate it. And uh, Chris and all, thank you very much for having me on this morning. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much, Congressman Lada. It's a, it's a pleasure to hear from you. And, and also, as I said with Congresswoman Dingle, thank you for your tremendous support throughout the years for this, for this effort and um, this issue. I, I will now turn it to, the, to our staff. They're gonna pull up the recorded message that we received for Congress, Congresswoman Captors. So that's fantastic. As that's being pulled up, I will just make sure I, there are some very kind words being spoken about Ohio Sea Grant and that's much appreciated, but clearly this is an all hands on deck um, effort and this was referenced by Congresswoman Dingle. I mean, there are many academic institutions you'll hear from and, and hear about as we go through this, uh, this virtual webinar today. So I'll turn it over to, um, um, to the staff to get uh, Congresswoman Captor's video up. Hello, I'm Congresswoman Marcy Captor, representative for Ohio's 9th Congressional District. Thank you for allowing me to once again be part of this important annual event, one that is focused on protecting our drinking water and quality of life here on Lake Erie shores. And I wish, wish you all health and safety during this challenging time. The seasonal HAB forecast allows us to track our progress toward reducing the reach of harmful algal blooms, to use science to fine tune our early warning technologies, and to further our understanding of the challenges before us as we work to restore and protect the Great Lakes. Because harmful algal blooms can be found in so many places, what we learn about our lake has implications for fresh water around our globe. Early projections show there will be a bloom in Lake Erie this year, but it will be smaller than 2019. While the smaller bloom is good news for our health, the safety of our community, the fact remains that our lake is still at risk. Our region is water rich and right now waterlogged. The problems in our region uh, have been exacerbated by climate change, which has led to record precipitation levels, increasing mild winters, and of course, increasing average temperatures. These factors have meant toxic blooms are a regular part of life on our lake. Learning how to value and manage water in this region is essential. The Great Lakes region generates 1.5 million jobs and generates $52 billion from recreation and tourism alone. However, we are going to continue to see challenges in our region. By the year 2050, the global population is projected to be nearly 10 billion people. In addition to managing fresh water, we will need to ramp up agricultural production to feed a hungry world. We must protect our precious resources for generations to come, including clean soils. While we are meeting today's remotely, today's participants are on the front lines of this very serious water quality conundrum, with millions of others depending on us to address HABs affecting the Great Lakes. It will not be easily solved, but we cannot allow ourselves to be discouraged or distracted. By crafting science-based policies, we can solve this puzzle and along the way learn crucial lessons about land and water management that we can carry into the future. I will continue to work to bring the federal resources needed to support research, conservation, restoration, as well as water infrastructure and treatment improvements. Thank you to NOAA, Ohio Sea Grant, and our federal and academic research partners for leading the way to promising innovative solutions. Our freshwater future and our ability to sustain life on Earth depends on our efforts to protect and restore fresh water on Lake Erie, on our Great Lakes, and across our great nation. And with that, I want to thank um, all three of our federal representatives for those, those kind words. And so it's great to see um, the great work going on in, in this system, but also the support that we're seeing from the highest levels of our, of our government. So this is phenomenal uh, to hear those words. So now what we're going to do is, is move into our, our loading talk with Dr. Laura Johnson and Dr. Rick Stump. Uh, again, what we will do here is you will, you will not see Laura Johnson. You will just hear her voice. Uh, post her presentation, we will move then quickly into Dr. Rick Stump's. And after those two is when we will open up Q&A. Feel free to um, use the chat function as you're hearing these talks and, and we will um, address those questions as we can. Um, and then again, when we're done, we will open up audio lines for some of our um, invited media
personnel to uh, ask questions um, audibly. So first, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Laura Johnson. Uh, many of you know Laura. She's a, a common individual working on this issue within the within Lake Erie. She is the director of the National Center for Water Quality Research at Heidelberg University. So I will turn the, the mic over to Dr. Laura Johnson. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Can you hear me? Yep, you're good to go. Okay. And... This isn't giving me the share. There we go. I have to click on it just right. Ta-da. And you can see my screen. Perfect. Yes, okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to be kicking this off. I just calculated in my head this is my sixth year of doing the Bloom forecast. So, you know, 2020 seems like a nice round year to start this off with. Hope you all have your science hats on because I'm going to show you some lovely data that we've been collecting on the Maumee River this past spring. But before I get into that, I just wanted a quick reminder here for you all um, that where, the, where we monitor on the Maumee River. So we monitor in Waterville. You can see it circled in red here. Um, and this is a map that I pulled from the uh, expanded load monitoring report. This is produced by Ohio EPA, and it's on the Lake Erie Commission website. And I did that because I want to point out that while we're monitoring at Waterville, it's actually just one of 29 stations all throughout the Maumee River watershed that are being sampled in collaboration with other agencies. So we have a number of sites, but you can also see that both the Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan USGS have a number of, of sampling locations in the Maumee as well. This one station is just one of 24 stations that we personally monitor. You can see a couple of the other sites, including the River Raisin and the Portage River. Um, and the, our other stations, we have a bunch that go into Lake Erie. We have some that go into the Ohio River, and we have a number of sites around Grand Lake St. Mary's as well. At every one of these sites, just about, we collect samples one to three times a day, all year round, so we never stop sampling, and we retrieve these samples weekly for analysis in the laboratory. I just wanted to point out, we've been monitoring in the Maumee River since 1975, which means since we're in 2020 and I'm showing you fresh off the presses data that this is our 45th year of sampling in this river. So um, I hope you all brought your champagne this morning. I'm sure that's totally kosher to be saying and to 400 and some people uh, to be able to celebrate that we've been doing this for quite some time now. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to show you our various forms of phosphorus, as per usual. And I, just a quick reminder, what we monitor for is total phosphorus and dissolved reactive phosphorus. Um, total phosphorus is essentially the sum of that dissolved phosphorus that you can't see that's dissolved in the water, and all of the phosphorus that's attached to particles that would be trapped on a piece of filter paper as you filter that water through it. However, what we've learned over time is that it's the bioavailable portion of that phosphorus that's really the most useful for doing the forecast. And so what I'm going to show you to start things off is total bioavailable phosphorus. And this is a combination of two things. It's the phosphorus of that particular phosphorus, essentially, that is um, available for algae to be able to use, but then also the phosphorus that doesn't settle in those 26 miles traveling from Waterville to the lake. So the actual um, the actual equation here is all of the dissolved reactive phosphorus, because that's highly bioavailable and about 8% of the particulates. So I'm going to start with total bioavailable phosphorus, but then I want to show some long-term trends, because I know that's on everyone's mind this year, and I'm going to show those specifically for dissolved phosphorus and particulate phosphorus. So this is the plot for total bioavailable phosphorus. I mean, I know it's exactly what you've probably even seen for the past few weeks from our early season projections, but I'll walk you all through it anyway. So this is showing how the loading has accumulated for total bioavailable phosphorus from March all the way through August. And um, basically what you see is that you, the way this works, and just we'll take a step back, the way this works is we have every day's load and we just sum them up over this whole period of time. So what you see is that in early March we really didn't have a whole lot of rain until probably about the mid-March area, we started to get, um, we had a series of some small storm events. It seemed like it rained every week for a little while there. And then once we hit mid-April, had a hot, basically nothing until a really big storm event at the end of May. That big storm event at the end of May brought in almost the same amount of loading as what we got early in that season. And from here on out, it's been dry. 
Now, the data that we have collected so far go up to the 1st of July. From July on, we're projecting using data from the National Weather Service Ohio River Forecast Center, uh, the flows that they can generate for the Maumee River. And so you can see that the projections are that it's going to basically continue to be hot and dry as it has been. Sorry, farmers. Um, but let's now compare this data to what we've seen in the past. So these are just our most recent years. You can see 2020 here in red is falling directly in between 2018 in purple and 2019 in black. So, you know, something between what we've seen in our most recent past years. We're not anywhere near as low as our lowest, which would have been in blue here in uh, 2012, or our highest in green in 2015. More specifically, we're expecting to have 325 metric tons of total bioavailable phosphorus by the end of our season, which puts us between 2018 and 2014. This bar chart, we're able to put more years on here so you have a little bit more detailed comparisons. This 325, although it looks fairly moderate in this plot right here, it still exceeds the target. I calculated what the bioavailable phosphorus target would be based off of uh, the existing targets. That's 240, and we've clearly exceeded that for this year. And that is all you're going to get on total bioavailable phosphorus. I'm going to move into some of our long-term trends now. So I want to talk about loads, but to talk about loads, I have to talk about water first. And so this is just stream flow discharge volume over our period of record going all the way back to 1975. Each bar is a different year. And what I've done is I first added a five-year running average to basically smooth some of that variation from year to year. And doing that, you can see that early in the period of record, we have some oscillations through these, through these few decades. But since the early 2000s, we've been seeing this continuous upward trend in flow because we've had some very intense rain events and rainy years, you would say, in terms of March through July stream flow. The gray line here is 2008. So you can see it matches up perfectly with 2008 because that's one of those years that we're using to compare for our target purposes. And in 2008, when this was set, looking back at the historical data, that level of flow is only ever exceeded once every uh, 10 years or so. But if you look from 2008 on, you can see we've had four events that have exceeded 2008 in the past 10 years. So it seems like we're now increasing that frequency of high flows, which is going to be an added challenge for our, um, meeting some of these targets moving forward. To help make 2020 stand out, I outlined it in black. And what you can see in 2020 is that we're below both the five-year running average and our 2008 levels. That means we're projecting, to be very specific, about 2.9 cubic kilometers of, of water coming out of, of the Maumee River from March through July. Now, I'm guessing that most of you don't think in cubic kilometers. I like to visualize it because it's so big. But I, I turned it into gallons for everyone. And so this is equivalent to about 785 billion gallons of water, which should remind you of how big the Maumee River really is, especially given that this is sort of an average year that's lower than some of our very large years. OK, so let's move on to particulate phosphorus. This is particulate phosphorus load. I'm going to just leave all these same things up. We're not bumping anything in right now. What you see is that the loads in the 80s were higher than anything that we really get anymore, right? So we, we had very high loads in the 80s. They jumped down. But we still see that same increase since the early 2000s. And if you look at that, that five-year running average line, it looks almost identical to the discharge line. And that's because essentially what that's telling us is that loads over the past 20 years or so are really being driven by flow. This year, we're expecting around 1,366 metric tons, which is almost double, a little over double, of what our target would be is 674. So we definitely have a lot of total particulate phosphorus from this year. It's above our target, above our five-year running average. And then dissolved phosphorus, which is our favorite one to talk about, at least mine, because that's what I talk about all the time, it seems like. And you can see that dissolved phosphorus has that U-shaped pattern where it was really high in the 80s, jumped down to the 90s, and has since increased. I want to point out that the loads in these 90s, where when we didn't have blooms nearly as frequently, averaged below our target fairly continuously until we got up into the 2000s. Um, the increase that we've seen since around 2002, similar to particular phosphorus and flow, looks very, very similar to those, right? So it's indicating these most recent loads are being driven by flow. We are expecting 
218 metric tons from, uh, from the Maumee River for this season, which is above our target of 186, but still lower than what our current five-year running average is. So I've alluded to this fact a lot already that our uh, loads are very driven by flow. And so one of the, the easiest ways to correct for that is to calculate what's called a flow-weighted mean concentration, which is basically taking that load and dividing it by flow. So it's a fairly simple calculation. There's a lot of other complicated ways to get to this, but this is the most simple way to think about it. And so you can see for total particulate phosphorus, what this helps us do is show how very high those flow weight mean concentrations were in the 80s, but that these concentrations for particulate phosphorus decreased into the 2000s. And really from the 2000s on, we haven't seen big shifts in concentration. So all that increase in load is all because of changes in flow. Except for this year. This year, we are currently at 0.47 milligrams per liter of total particulate phosphorus, which you can see is way above our target line here, which is about 0.18. And it's also um, above where our five-year running average is. The general assumption that I've heard and sort of, you know, inquiring about why we might see higher particulate phosphorus this year is that coming out of last year where we were unable to plant a lot of our fields, there's a little bit more ground working to deal with both weed burden um, as well as poor soil conditions, but on top of that, we know that having barren and fallow fields can sometimes lead to increased particulate phosphorus runoff associated with them being fallow, soil crusting and stuff like that. For dissolved phosphorus, you can see again that U-shaped curve where concentrations were high, they bumped down to below the target through the 90s, and then increased from around the 2000s. In the most recent 10 years or so, we haven't had a whole lot of change in flow weighted uh, mean concentrations either up or down, but they have been awfully variable. So there's a lot of variation here. And part of this is because we have really low flow years. You can see them here, the 2012, 2016, I think, I think those are the two big ones right here. Um, those really low years tend to have an effect on concentration as well. This year we're at 0 0.075 milligrams per liter just below the five-year running average, um, but still well above the target of 0 0.05. Okay, so this is all interesting and stuff in terms of thinking about these trends, but knowing that loads are so strongly influenced by stream flow and concentrations are to some point, one of the best ways to start to look at trends in these data is to look at the plot of loads versus stream flow discharge. And what you can see for dissolved reactive phosphorus is this is a fairly tight relationship. What I'm showing here are data from 2002 to 2018. And um, I think we're having a fire alarm, so I'm going to go quickly here. Uh, so from, 20, uh, from uh, 2002 to 2018, um, these are the prediction intervals. And so we have various different points here, right? So if we're above these prediction intervals, um, then we know that our levels are high. So if we had a point that was this, up here, then we'd be higher than normal. We're outside of typical data. But we know we have this target set, right? The loading target here means that um, that's what we want to get below so we don't have an intense bloom. So if we were down here, we'd be below the target. But we have a second target, which is based off of concentration, so that when flow gets really high, it might be really hard to get this loading target. So we might end up being at this point here, which would be below the concentration target, but not quite hitting that loading target. And so that leaves us with one extra space that I haven't filled in yet, and here it is in gray, which is sort of this in-between area where we're lower than normal, so we're going in the right direction here, but it's not quite to the target. And if you saw, I pumped up a, 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 a included a little spot here, which is 2019, because that was the ideal example of that scenario. Finally, we have as expected. If we're somewhere between these prediction intervals, then we can't say that there's any difference in this data compared to these past data, right? So where are we this year? Well, we're right down here, right? So we didn't, haven't had a whole lot of loading, but goodness, we're right smack dab in the middle of that prediction interval, right? So what we would have expected would have been 230 metric tons. What we actually observed was 216 metric tons. So perfectly in this normal range. So let's do the same thing now for total particulate phosphorus. You can see I had to arrange, rearrange some of the targets and some of the lines a little bit, but you can see that 2020 is actually up in the green a little bit. That is, 
if you remember, in the green means higher than normal. We're outside of our prediction interval here. We would have expected 832 metric tons. What we actually have observed so far is 1,360. So that is fairly high for, for what we would expect. But in this scenario, you can see that loading in really high wet years would have been higher. Okay, so I'm just about done here. Just a few conclusions. First of all, what we've seen so far this year is that stream flow discharge is average, almost um, perfectly average compared to 2002 to 2018, but it's lower than our current five-year running average because we've had a lot of really high flow years in the past five years. DRP loads were similarly lower than our five-year running average, but they've been very similar to 2018, and they're exactly where we would expect them to be based off of this past data. However, particulate phosphorus loads were higher than a lot of things. They're higher than our five-year running average, higher than targets, higher than what we would have expected based off of the amount of flow we've had this year. But the real question is trends, right? And, you know, since 2002, we've had some really interesting years. Last year's a great example where DRP loads were lower than we would have expected, um, or we've had some years where concentrations for either particulate phosphorus or DRP are higher than expected but we haven't had a directional detectable downward trend yet. Um, we've learned a lot, but I, and I think that's gonna help us with our management, and I believe that um, Sandra Leda is gonna go over all of the management plans that have sort of led up to where we are today and how we're moving forward with this. So with that, I would screenshot my contact information because I'm gonna move over to Rick very quickly. Great, thank you, Laura, for that. So as I uh, said at the beginning, uh, Please continue to put your questions in through the chat function, which I'm seeing them trickle in right now. We're going to go to Rick with the actual forecast. After Rick is done, we will, we will start addressing some of those questions that are coming in. Um, so let me introduce Dr. Rick Stump. Um, Rick is an oceanographer with NOAA's National Center for Coastal Ocean Sciences. And if those of you that are not familiar with the Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, this is the um, office in NOAA that is all things hats. Also, you should know that this, they are the co-lead on the interagency working group with the U.S. EPA. So the Center, uh, National Center for Coastal Ocean Sciences plays a key role in, in HAB's work throughout the, throughout the country. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Rick Stump to uh, give your 2020 forecast of the Western, Western Lake Erie. Okay, thank you, Chris. Assume you can hear me okay and can see the slide. Both, correct. We can hear you and see your slide. Great, okay, uh, it's great to be here. Um, and uh, the, uh, in order to do a forecast, there's a, a whole set of work. I can't emphasize enough the incredible value of the data that the Heidelberg collects out of uh, the center that Laura leads. Um, our ability to do forecasts is possible because of the, uh, the detail and information that we have on the lowest flowing into Lake Erie. Uh, the overall models, uh, we use an ensemble of models here, and each model has different assumptions and information input, and they come from a variety hey, of... Hey, Rick, this is Chris Winslow. Sorry to interrupt. Can you just try and get closer to your microphone? A little bit of your volume is breaking up, sir. Is that better? That's much better. Thank you for that, sir. Okay. And uh, we use, there's a variety of different models in here, and uh, actually it's a point that Representative Capture has made. Um, if when we forecast, our ability to forecast and forecast accurately means we understand the system. And, and how we do that in different approaches tells us more about how we understand it and what factors drive the bloom. So in order to get to the questions of the best way to control the blooms, uh, it's, the, these forecasts become incredibly important. So as Laura's indicated about the importance of dissolved phosphorus um, and compared to say total phosphorus, the information comes out of, of doing these types of forecasts. So I'll continue on here. And I'll just do a short recap um, from last year. Um, the forecast was, ac was accurate. The bloom was a 7.3 severity and we forecast a 7.5. I'll note, <clears throat> as people may recall, it was a, quite a wet spring. The um, total phosphorus and the discharge were actually equal to the severe years of 2011 and 15. The total bioavailable phosphorus, however, was much lower and the bloom was consistent with that. So last year, Nature actually handed us an experiment to confirm that bioavailable phosphorus is the key factor on this as compared to the total phosphorus. Bloom was also quite intense in the Western Basin. 
it did not spread much into the central basin. And that has to do with winds, which unfortunately the wind directions, we can't, we can't forecast that far um, in advance going out a month or two. Uh, this is what it's looked like um, uh, since through our monitoring starting in 2002. This is the peak bloom in each year. And you can see how 2019, it was actually very intense in this area. The reddish colors are areas where you're most likely to see scum, the highest concentrations. And the, the lighter blues on some of these, those are relatively low concentrations that you probably would not see with your eye some of these years. <clears throat> and you can see the, um, the odd years actually have had the worst blooms, and that is a coincidence. There is nothing to say that even years are inherently mild and odd years are bad. But 2011, 13, 15, 17 were the four worst um, blooms in 2019. You can see 2018, for example, there were very few areas of red at the peak. Um, about the same, but a lot of very low concentrations of the blue, the light blue color there. So it gives their context for different years. Um, just as a brief note, um, we're not done with forecasting in NOAA. Um, there is the Lake Erie Bulletin, and this year that is actually now online. You will still get a bulletin, but you, um, you'll still get a notification when there are updates, and that will, those will continue twice a week. But you can actually go online to, to this website, type in burnsnow.gov tab slash lakeerie.html. And now what has been added is a, a 3D model, which includes more information. We actually have a little bit on the vertical distribution and the potential to indicate the likelihood in the next couple of days of whether the bloom might be at the surface producing scum or mixed through the waterfall. Um, you can subscribe to the bulletin. There's any number of ways you can get there through any one of these sites. And then there's also additional, we have field work through our um, Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab up in Ann Arbor, who has started going out weekly. They've been able to work that out with their, the vessel, and they are collecting toxin data and other quite valuable information. They also have continuous monitoring um, instruments also. And so for those who are looking for more detail at particular, these are particular locations. These are stations that have weekly and continuous monitoring. I suggest you go there. So we have monitoring and forecasting through a variety of ways so people have the ability to check that. One last is we are posting imagery every day of the bloom location. And we have I have a short website link here, go.usa.gov, XF capital C A Q. Um, that'll get you there. Um, this is actually um, a the bloom low intensity has started just in the last few days and it's uh, um, up um, pretty much Mommy Bay going up towards the Michigan shoreline. We're still at a, these are low concentrations. I can't emphasize that enough. We're not at high concentrations at this point. Um, it's not unusual for a bloom to start in July. It's, we're still trying to work out questions about the timing of when it's starting. Uh, that imagery is updated each day. If it's exciting for us, we can not see it. Okay, when we do this, we do an ensemble of models. Um, for most people looking, these will sound like a lot of uh, a lot of words, complicated statistical and mechanical models. But there are uh, several sources. We have some models that we developed here at NOAA. There's a, a combination of University of Michigan and NC State University have um, uh, some models that they run, and then Carnegie Institute of Science and Stanford University also has one. These are, they have some different assumptions, each one has different assumptions on, on how they incorporate the phosphorus loads and the timing and so forth. And that, um, that means we have uh, different basis for these in which we can compare when we look at the, the, how bad the bloom was at the end of the year. This on the right here is a repeat from Laura. So the total bioavailable phosphorus is um, 225 metric tons for this season. And uh, you can see that's greater in 2018. And note that is smaller in 2014. Um, here that many people are most concerned about. So we put, we put the ensemble together and we have a forecast. And this is, this is where we forecast for this year, a severity of 4.5. Um, there could be a possible range between 4 and 5.5. You note last year had a severity of 7.3. And so this puts us 
kind of squarely between 2018 and 2019. The uh, Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement target uh, for phosphorus, the lower referred to, would lead to a bloom severity of, a, of three. And so um, while we are definitely better than last year, we are still, we are forecasting that we will be above the target um, here. That means there will be some noticeable bloom out on Lake Erie this year. That's what we would expect. 4.5. Um, as far as the phosphorus loads, what would what if we do those reductions? What would that mean? Well, this year, um, if we could have reduced the um, the current load and bioavailable phosphorus by an additional 30 percent, then we would have had a forecast that would have met the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. If we achieve the 40 percent reduction, which would be the one in red here, that that's the size of bloom we would expect, which would be a negligible bloom. And it's just there. Um, Laura noted some of the um, relatively high loads in, since 2008, and several of these years would have had a bloom above the um, objective that we're, we're trying to achieve, but you notice that um, they would be much smaller. The 2017 bloom, which if you recall, extended from downtown Toledo all the way to Ontario in September, would have been um, much um, about half the severity as we as was actually observed, and 2019 would have been very close to the threshold. So, getting that managed to get that reduction, which means reducing the concentration. That's the key part. We can't control flow, but we we have something. We do have an ability to influence the concentration. That's that's what we need to do. Um, to summarize this up. Uh, 2020 forecast is definitely um, use Lake Erie. Um, hopefully, Stone Lab will be able to get out there some as well. Um, we expect it to be, again, a 4.5. The likely range is between 4 and 5.5. That's between 2018 and 2019. And again, I'll notice above the, the Great Lakes objective of three. But this is a much improvement over what we saw last year. Um, I will say, much of the lake will be fine most of the time. Um, the blooms are mostly in the western basin, but even there, they move around a lot with the wind. Um, people do get asked, we do get asked questions about the lake level and why it's very high. We do not have any um, evidence, at least from based on last year, that it's a factor in the bloom. Um, we will be keeping track of that as well. But right now, we don't see that as an indication. I will note that there will be some areas with high concentrations. Um, we can monitor those, the, our ability with the satellite detection. They have a strong risk of scum during calm days. So um, there will be areas where high concentrations and we have the ability to see and know where those things occur. Um, please check our bulletin for those locations so you, so you can plan ahead for where you are. And it's not unusual for them to be, while they could be in the middle. I can't emphasize enough. Bloom does produce some toxin and it concentrates in the scum. So please stay out of scum. The bloom impact varies with the wind. Um, for the people on the call, if you're in Ohio or Michigan, you're going to want south and west winds. If you're in Ontario, you're going to prefer winds from the north. Um, the practical part of it is it does move the bloom around, and we have um, this very clear patterns of movement. Um, we do forecast going out several days, and that includes the wind. So the forecast that we do of the bloom location will give an idea of which way that's going. So it's potential for uh, up to four to five days of, of knowing knowing whether the bloom might move out away from where it already is. And that wraps up what we have here. Thank you so much. Rick, thank you very much for that. So as I mentioned earlier, what we're going to do now is, is open up for questions um, for both Laura and her loading information and her presentation and Rick for the forecast. Um, so for the media um, staff, they will be um, unmuted so they can ask their question live. For those of you that are just uh, registered attendees, use the chat function. Uh, Rick, for you, um, in the start of each of your sentences, the volume was coming through all right, but it would tailor off towards the end. So if you can continue to try and project your responses, that would be fantastic. Um, so Jill Gentis, uh, lead of our communications in, in the office here, uh, can you help uh, manage the media questions coming in? 
Sure. Um, we have several uh, media people who would like to interview uh, Rick and Laura later, but we do have several questions. Uh, the first one I am going to unmute is Sean Hegarty of Channel 13. Sean, are you unmuted? Yep. He should be unmuted. It might take a second to connect to audio, maybe. Okay. John, go ahead with your question when you're ready. Hey, this is Sean. Uh, yep, no, we got you, Sean. You're good. Go ahead. What is that saying about what members of the community are doing or not doing? Uh, to help with the load or making it worse. Laura, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so Sean, I, I'm guessing you're saying, you know, the fact that we don't have a huge uh, trend either one direction or the other, what does that say about, about actions on the ground, essentially? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, there's there's a couple of really interesting points here. You know, from last year in 2019, one of the things that we learned is that um, the the ways in which what we think is that you know the ways in which we um, that farmers apply their fertilizer or manure can have up to a potentially a 30 percent um, reduction or effect on dissolved reactive phosphorus. But remember to flip that around. That means an awful lot of that load that comes out that 70 percent is reflecting some number of past years, you know, from more than one year before whatever we're measuring. And so what we have to remember is that a lot of the actions that were taking place, the things that were going to have a really big influence are going to be things like nutrient management plans, like how, how much do you apply on the ground to make sure you're not over applying, but you're feeding crops and it's in the right location, those types of questions, they might take some time to really be able to have an effect. Now, I know that's one of the things that's been picking up speed a lot lately. There's more and more nutrient management plans going out, and they've been somewhat popular in the past already, too. So I would expect word that that big chunk that reflects possibly this longer term, you know, you can call it legacy, but we don't really know how old it is, forms of phosphorus, um, you know, just it's going to take a little time. And just to, to add to that, um, know that we're, we're talking many millions of acres in the Western Basin, um, and so there's got to be a, you know, a lot of activities on a lot of acres, which are um, some of those uh, best management practices we're asking for are, are not um, cheap to deploy. They're also not often easy to deploy. And then what I want to also highlight is that some of these best management practices that are put out on the field, things like cover crops and things like that, there is a, a Evidence is showing a lag in that ability to just, as soon as that practice is put in place, that doesn't mean there's an instantaneous reduction in, in nutrient inputs. So there is a, a lag effect, and, and again, we're talking about a lot of, lot of acres. But in my experience working with many producers, um, there is a, clearly an uptick in engagement in, in doing stuff in the landscape, uh, best management practices in the landscape to address this. Thank so, you, Laura. Yep. I also have a question for Rick. Do you want me to hold off? you want to go through questions with Laura first? I, no, I don't think it matters which, which individual. So go, go right ahead. Um, we'll take your question, then we'll move to another, um, another individual. Uh, Rick, sir, uh, if I could, we're seeing the bloom and we're starting to see some of the green in downtown Toledo. Do you at this point know why it's not as pronounced in the lake and we're seeing it more in the river in the downtown portion? The uh, good question, uh, and I happen to know that we managed to get some uh, or some people out there to sample um, yesterday to look at that bloom. That is uh, unlike in 2017 when the bloom showed up, that 2017 bloom actually blew in from the lake. And in this case, it appears to be developing locally. The, our current best guess is, is with the very low flow and the very high lake level, the um, the water is pretty much stopping in in downtown Toledo. It's uh, kind of hard to think of an, an estuary and tides and that sort of thing when you're in the lake, but effectively the lake is holding back the water with the flow. So we think what's happening is it's very still 
and that's causing the phosphorus to 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 concentrate in that area. And uh, cyanobacteria like warm warm water, warm temperatures, and it's been warm, and also very still flow. So um, this is a bit of an anomaly, we think, because of the combination of low flow and the very high lake level producing the downtown Toledo effect bloom. Thank so you. When, you say, when you say that it's developing locally, does that does that give you a sense of certain particular place it's coming from locally, or is it just the lake blocking it in? It's just the lake blocking it in. So it's in the river. It's, you do get blooms farm in rivers under very low flow. And so um, the lake is just holding it in, so it's not, it can't flow out very well. And to add to that, I know that some of our scientists, uh, you know, out of Heidelberg and Boulder State University and University of Toledo were out taking samples in that yesterday. And so um, there is a possibility to run the genetics on that also, because we know the strains of cyanobacteria in the river are different than those in the lake. So you'll be able to ascertain that. Is that um, river water just being held in the, in the mouth of the Maumee Bay? I see that we have two more media that are that want to ask uh, questions uh, with unmuted. So, Jill, I'll turn that back over to you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sean, for your uh, questions. Uh, we have Sarah Donaldson with uh, Farm and Dairy. We're going to unmute her. Sarah, are you on? Farm and Dairy, can you hear me? Yep, we've got you. Thank you. All right, Go awesome. Ahead. Uh, so you had both mentioned that the level of bioavailable phosphorus is an important factor that affects the blooms. Um, what influences the level of bioavailable phosphorus as opposed to the total phosphorus? Hi, this is Laura. I'll give it a, a first shot here. Um, okay. Bioavail if you if you notice in the um, in the equation, you know, bioavailable phosphorus is um, mostly dissolved phosphorus. And so basically any of the trends, anything that affects something like a dissolved phosphorus is going to have a, a larger effect over bioavailable phosphorus than particulate. Um, the things that affect the bioavailability of particulate phosphorus I think are a little bit more difficult to ascertain, especially sort of in our landscape, but you know, presumably things like uh, improving soil health and changing sort of the uh, character of the particulates that are running off from, say, farm fields. Um, would probably have a, a larger effect on the bioavailability of those particulates. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll just leave it at that. Uh, the things that would be affecting something like a dissolved phosphorus runoff in, in agricultural areas or even, honestly, golf courses, residential areas, usually the first thing is over-application of phosphorus. So if you have a lot of soil test phosphorus in a field, it tends to just leach dissolved phosphorus. Now, we don't see and the data that we have that, that soil test phosphorus in this region are exceedingly high. There's like, you know, very small, maybe hot spots here and there, but it's not uh, something that is very common for the Maumee River watershed. It's far more common in other areas of U.S. that have these types of problems. And so the other things that we think attribute to the loss of dissolved phosphorus um, has to do with the placement of phosphorus. So if it's surface applied, it has a higher risk of runoff. We know in fields in our area, the, the soils tend to be a heavy clay, so phosphorus can run through uh, cracks and fissures and root channels and earthworm holes and get into our subsurface drainage really easily. Um, and that can be a, a metric, a way in which that dissolved phosphorus is leaving. And then the final one is something that has, was like the very first thing the state took action on is, you know, applying fertilizer or manure right before a rain event or on frozen ground. Those are two things that lead to be these big pulses and dissolved phosphorus that uh, we don't see very often. Laura, thanks for that. And, and I will add, there is um, information that's, that's being, or research is being done right now to figure out how that phosphorus cycles between bound to particulates and dissolved um, as it moves down the river. And so, uh, Dr. Jim Hood and uh, Dr. Audrey Sawyer out of OSU are, are doing some of those experiments now and have gotten funding, uh, Jim specifically through the Ohio Department of Higher Education, to really look at how does that phosphorus get attached to and released from particulates. And so we're doing work right now to figure out that dynamic, how much of that pool of phosphorus is dissolved um, versus um, bound to particulates. So still great work happening there, but we are starting to, to see some answers. So I'll come back to you for another media question. 
Yes, thanks, Sarah. Um, and we also have Karen Schaefer, who is a freelance public radio journalist, and uh, she has a question. Karen, are you on? I think Karen is still working on calling in if you want to do uh, James's question first. All right. Um, James Prophet from uh, DBTV Great Lakes Now has a couple of questions. One is, um, is there a number one culprit for source of dissolved reactive phosphorus? And if, and if so, has that source been mitigated or improving? Laura, did you want to take a first cut again? Sure, yeah, no problem. Uh, and, uh, so is there a number one culprit for source of dissolved reactive phosphorus? You know, there is in theory, but I would say not an observation. So like I was saying before, you know, typically the first thing you look at when you have a really high amount of dissolved phosphorus is how much, how much is in the soil? What is your soil test phosphorus level? But since those aren't all that high, between our observations and a lot of modeling efforts, it seems like it's really pointing to um, high surface phosphorus on like, you know, that top one inch of the, of the soil. And so if we're thinking of something that would be the easiest fix, no, the, I wouldn't say the easiest fix, but a potential fix would be trying to subsurface apply or maybe do strip tilling to try and get that phosphorus a little bit deeper in the soil. The reason I say it's not the easiest fix is because the equipment to do that is limited and uh, rather expensive. Um, and so it's hard to get that spread like widely throughout the basin. Um, and also we don't have, uh, we don't have a good comparison as to exactly how much effect that's gonna have on dissolved phosphorus. Of course, adding less or changing how you're applying and when you're applying also are the big things and those have been dealt with. Um, the final thing, normally people, when they think about something like dissolved phosphorus, traditionally it had been uh, wastewater treatment plants, but we know that in Lake Erie, uh, wastewater treatment plants have worked on reducing dissolved phosphorus and effluent ever since, what, like the late, <laughs> the mid to late 70s or earlier in the 70s, right? And had some huge, huge reductions then. And so those, those point source contributions are fairly minor relative to our non-point sources now. And just to add on the top of Laura, um, we do know that, you know, a large percentage of, uh, of the phosphorus, you know, somewhere depending on the year, 65 to 80% is, is coming from um, non-point sources, so land runoff. Um, but within that land runoff, it, it isn't one source there either. I mean, there are some scenarios where it might be a commercial fertilizer um, contribution. Sometimes it might be manure. Sometimes it's that legacy pool. Um, and even from the urban landscape, where that's coming from, um, is it septic systems, um, CSO? So there are a lot of sources. It, it, we wish it was that here's the one source, here's that silver bullet, but it's just not that easy. It's, it's much more complicated. Joe, back to you. All right, we have uh, Karen Schaefer now on the phone, and then we'll take one more, and then uh, we'll move to the next presentations. Karen, are you on? I should be. Can you hear me? We can, Karen. Yeah. You're good to go. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you for holding this. Um, a question to both Laura and Rick, and perhaps you too, Chris. Uh, we've had a little pandemic thing uh, that coincided with the beginning of the uh, algae bloom season on Lake Erie. How has COVID-19 impacted monitoring, testing, and so on? And how do you anticipate that it may go on doing so as the year goes on? Why don't I start at the algal bloom and then Laura, you can uh, back up into the river. Um, we, uh, as far as our ability to, to monitor from our, our satellite processing is fully op operational. Um, so uh, we're good to go there. We don't expect um, any issues at all. Uh, our field monitoring program, uh, we managed to get that started. It's a reduced number of stations, but it is, that is running now also. And we, um, at this point, uh, would expect that to get to continue. Uh, so the weekly monitoring for toxins and bloom presence, at least from our side. Um, so those parts are going fine. Uh, Laura, you perhaps cover challenges you've all had. 
Yeah, so certainly there were some challenges, you know, when the, the pandemic, you know, started kicking off and everything was going on in quarantine. The last thing I wanted to do was um, have any of uh, any of our lab technicians at risk because we're collecting water samples, you know. But leading up to a bloom forecast, it's been sort of a, it was a bit of a challenge trying to figure out well, how do we deal with this? Because we know that uh, bloom size is a public health issue and a lot of especially when it comes to the toxicity. So we've been lucky that we were able to reduce some of our sampling to reasonable limit levels and did a, some quality control to make sure that our data were good. And in the end, what we've, we've only been missing probably by about a week worth of the Maumee River data through the spring. Um, then we have some other sites that we're missing more data from because shipping samples back and forth was really difficult once campus was closed. Um, I think the other thing is being at a small university like Heidelberg, and since we're the major research group here on campus, we were able to keep our operations going because it, you know, uh, we were pretty much the only ones here on campus and so we were able to get some special permissions for that. So, so it has been challenging but we've been able to, to work through that and still get some really good data. Uh, I would add in just an interesting complication, the, the gauge, the USGS gauge at uh, Waterville, there was uh, um, plans to replace that, that got postponed because of the COVID. And so a little bit of um, extra work in between um, Laura's group and um, the Weather Service Office, uh, the Ohio River Forecast Center, and trying to get those flows to come out correctly. Um, so it's the sort of thing you wouldn't necessarily think of, that uh, postponement because they, they couldn't get out and finish the, installing the, gate, the new gate. Yeah. But that's where we can be super thankful that um, that USGS has so many different gauging stations throughout the Maumee. So, you know, we can compare what we were seeing at Waterville to other sites and, and see what makes sense for that data. Great. Thanks for those questions. And Laura and Rick, thanks for your, your great responses. So what we're going to do is we're going to close down the Q&A QA, um, QA for these two talks. You can ask questions at the end. Laura and Rick will stick with us and be able to answer questions at the end. But we want to get to our four other speakers that we have lined up for you. Um, we've asked these individuals to give you, you know, a handful of slides somewhere in that five to seven minute update. Um, I will just set the stage for this. This is uh, when I get to interact with my colleagues and, and all the questions that come to Sea Grant and Stone Lab. Um, I'm hoping these speakers will be, ab be able to address some of the common questions and, and, and um, inquiries that I get from stakeholders. So the first uh, on our agenda to come up next here is uh, Blake Schaefer. Um, Blake is a research physical scientist with the Envi U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Um, so we will get uh, Blake's presentation up here and we'll unmute Blake. Blake, can you uh, test the audio, please? Morning, Chris. Can you hear me okay and see my slide? We can see the slides and we can hear you, so please go for it, sir. Perfect. Thank you, everyone, and good morning. I'm very excited to share some of the science that we're able to make publicly available um, across the United States. Today, I'll only be able to briefly introduce you to the Cyanobacteria Assessment Network, or we refer to it as Cyan for short. This is a cross-federal agency collaboration between NOAA, so the satellite algorithm that you heard Rick talk about earlier for Lake Erie, was developed originally by NOAA. We have taken that algorithm and applied it to all of the largest lakes across the United States and Alaska um, in collaboration with NOAA. Um, to do that, we've worked with NASA. So NASA primarily produces the imagery for the project across the United States, and they're also responsible for the quality assurance of that data. USGS works with us in our on-the-ground validation, and they're also helping us with some Landsat data archives that are very informative for the project as well. And then finally, I'm from the Environmental Protection Agency, and my role is in developing the management application. So what can we do with the satellite and that data to make informed decisions? The mission of Cyan is to support the environmental management and public use of US lakes by detecting cyanobacteria using these satellite technologies. If you're interested in more details about the project, you can certainly go to our website, epa.gov slash cyanoproject, or if you screenshot um, and take a picture with your smartphone, uh, this QR code will bring you to that same website as well. Today, I'm only gonna get an opportunity to mention how our Cyan Android mobile application 
is being used to reduce the barriers for the public to use this satellite information in monitoring cyanobacteria, hopefully somewhat similar to your familiarity with um, weather data. The mobile application um, uses satellite data for monitoring 2,000 or more of the largest U.S. lakes, and we'll talk about a little bit more about that in a second. Um, I usually get asked right away, are you going to make a, a version available beyond Android? And the answer is yes. We are building a web-based version in development, and that will be accessible with any operating system as long as you access it through uh, a uh, web browser. Um, that's going undergoing beta testing with our identified collaborators starting next week. And as we're successful, we will continue moving forward with a public release in the future. The mobile app is primarily updated weekly. Um, so the information that I will show you this, uh, at this webinar for this week actually represents the monitoring data from the satellite from last week. Um, I should also clarify that this is not a forecast capability. This is a direct monitoring capability via the satellite. Typically, the app is updated usually on a Tuesday or Wednesday. So what happens is for this entire week, Saturday through Sunday, we're collecting and NASA is collecting and processing the satellite imagery. And then by the time the entire United States gets processed and uploaded to the mobile app, it's usually uh, somewhere around Tuesday or Wednesday morning. Uh, if you want more details on the mobile app and a more detailed training, again, you can use your phone to direct yourself to uh, a YouTube video uh, using the QR code in, in the bottom left of the screen. So the next question I usually get is, can I use the app for my lake? And as I mentioned earlier, what we're focused on is 2,000 plus of the largest lakes across the United States. What does that mean? Uh, typically, it, a lake has to be larger than 900 meters across. And to translate that to maybe something a little bit more tangible, it's about nine football fields across um, for us to resolve this. So all the black dots that you see uh, speckled across the United States are lakes that we've identified that should be large enough to be resolved in our imagery. Uh, if you want more details about all this information on the technical side and also a list of all the lakes by state, uh, again, you can use this QR code to um, direct you towards that documentation. I will uh, mention that there are, and when you look at the imagery, there are going to be more lakes that are smaller than we've identified, that 900 meter cross, that could potentially still be resolvable. Um, as you're familiar, you know, these systems are very dynamic, they're changing, and we want to provide as much information as possible. So we're providing everything that we can potentially resolve to the public for making the most uh, data in available. The other thing I want to point out is you'll notice these white lines breaking up the United States into these uh, kind of grid tiles is what we call them. The reason we break up the U.S. this way is it's a way of reducing the data use on your mobile phone. So if you're interested in just an area, say in Lake Michigan, you're only pulling the area relevant to your interest and you don't have to download through your phone the entire United States, which would chew up quite a bit of your data plan. And for this particular um, example, we're going to focus in again um, in the Lake Michigan area. So we're gonna pull this tile using the mobile app that I have highlighted here in dark black. So this is actually a screenshot um, from my phone and you can see I've got a couple of pins placed throughout the United States in areas of interest. Those pins only re represent the specific latitude and longitude coordinates of where that pin is actually located. And for this example here, I'm gonna hone in on Wisconsin um, in this black circle here. And if I was in the app and I actually clicked directly on this pin, you'll see this kind of user interface pop up. And here we've selected uh, an area in Lake Winnebago. It's giving us the current approximate equivalent cell count concentration. Uh, so you have something um, to reference by, and it tells you how that concentration has changed since the last detection. The next question I usually get up asked is, the date that it's referenced is 2019, so is the app up to date? Yes, what I want people to know is the app is only transmitting data when cyanobacteria are detected via the satellite. Again, that's to reduce data transmission and data usage on your phone. So we're not sending you a bunch of either non-detects or QA flags. We're only sending you when there's detections of cyanobacteria. 
However, there is a way to always view the most recent image on your phone. If you select this option that's, again, highlighted in this black square, the view latest image, you will always see the most recent image for that specific tile. So you can see this is the white kind of boundary line that was drawn on that app, on that map originally. And you can see we're getting almost the entirety of Lake Michigan, some Green Bay area, a lot of Wisconsin and Michigan as well. The app allows you to then zoom in. If you want to take your fingers, zoom, pan around. Um, you can also change the transparency so you can kind of see Google Maps behind this to orientate yourself if you need road, road references or anything like that. Um, and the concentrations here are represented in the color bar. We're using the same color bar as Rick showed earlier. It's from NOAA. The cool colors in the blue are low concentrations. The high colors, or the high concentrations are represented in the warmer colors in the red. And I'll just conclude by zooming in again from last week's image. You can see here what the bloom looked like um, across the state, and even it looks like we're starting to get some detection in the southern part of Green Bay. I'd like to thank everybody for their time and attention, and I'll be happy to turn it back over to the next speaker. Great, thank you for that, Blake. Um, so um, to keep up with some of these tools that we wanted to introduce the audience to, this this is a great tool for those larger lakes outside of the, the five Great Lakes. But many people might be asking about what if my my lake's smaller than that? And so I want to turn it over to our next speaker, which is Dr. Tim Davis. He's an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences, Sciences at Bowling Green State University, and he's going to talk to you about a, a soon to be coming out tool. Um, that might help individuals in these smaller lakes. So, uh, Jim, I'll turn it over to you. Tim, can you test your audio, please? Yeah, working on that. Good. No, I can hear you. So just uh, okay. yep. great, perfect. All right, very good. Um, okay, we should be up and running. You're good. Oh, thanks so much. Let me. Um, Move this out of the way here for me. All right, so, uh, well, thanks, thanks, Blake, and thanks, uh, Chris, for inviting me to speak today. Um, the reason why Chris asked me to, uh, to talk to you about this uh, new NOAA-funded project was because uh, on, on previous renditions of this forecast, uh, they, they typically, a lot of typical questions come into, well, you know, what about toxicity um, or toxin concentrations of the bloom? Can we forecast that? Do we know how bad it's going to be? And I guess the short answer to that is uh, we're working on it. There are many projects uh, currently ongoing to uh, try to develop a toxin uh, concentration forecast uh, for Western Lake Erie um, and other regions of the country. Uh, but for right now, we don't have that tool. So how can we better track um, harmful algal bloom toxins in Western Lake Erie linking citizen scientists with researchers. So uh, the way I wanted to start this uh, presentation off was by hopefully, my computer is freezing, there we go. All right, uh, kind of taking a step back. And uh, this is a, the what I'm gonna be talking to you about first is a project uh, it's a NOAA EcoHab funded project that's being led by Justin Chapman at the Ohio State University. And this project uh, is a uh, collaboration of multiple universities that are trying to develop the necessary information in order to help modelers like Rick and his team uh, forecast uh, toxin concentrations in Western Lake Erie. And part of that project is what we call the HABS grab. Now, the HABS grab is a coordinated sampling effort that occurred in 2018 and 2019. You can see the uh, project partners over on the right for both years. Uh, in 2018, we specifically focused on the uh, U.S. side of the western basin of Lake Erie, and that's the, those are the data that I'll be presenting today. And in 2019, we expanded that uh, to include our uh, Canadian counterparts uh, so that we could actually collect samples from across the basin. And we collected over 100 samples in about three hours using standardized techniques. And then we all met up back at the uh, University of Toledo Lake Erie Center where we um, processed those samples and they were all analyzed 
um, in the exact same way so that we could compare apples to apples across all the data being collected by all the organizations. So what you're seeing here, what this picture is showing is a heat map of the cyanobacterial density uh, that's derived through Rick's algorithm. And on top of that are locations where we sampled for bloom toxicity during the 2018 HABs grab. Now, this is really interesting because the data that we were able to collect showed that while the bloom is extensive, we see toxin concentrations vary, and they don't always align with cyanobacterial density. So if you look at the upper right portion of the bloom, you do see some warmer colors uh, indicating higher uh, cyanobacterial density as well as higher toxin concentrations. But in the lower right, you see higher toxin concentrations with relatively mild uh, cyanobacterial densities. So we can't always uh, say that if there are higher cyanobacterial densities, there will be higher toxin concentrations and vice versa. Um, but as Rick said, it's always important if you see scums to avoid them. So that will always be true. Now, these were large coordinated sampling efforts that were conducted on a single day each year in 2018 and 2019. So as the group got together and we saw the power of what we were able to accomplish by sampling over 100 different locations in less than three hours, we started talking about, well, how can we try to expand the spatial temporal uh, data collection of toxins within Western Lake Erie? And as Rick mentioned before, you know, NOAA Glural, University of Toledo, uh, Stone Lab, and BGSU and other organizations have near real time, uh, you know, bloom monitoring technologies, which in some cases do include some uh, toxin measurements. But we thought it would be really neat to be able to involve citizen scientists in this effort to collect more data. So we got together and we wrote a successful uh, NOAA MERHAB funded project where we are linking a new portable uh, quantitative toxin detection technology, which I'll talk about in a minute, with researcher and citizen science um, water collection to try to get a more seasonal, uh, better spatial temporal resolution of cyanobacterial toxins in the western basin of Lake Erie. So the technology that we're introducing with this uh, project is the MBIO uh, duplex toxin detection uh, system. And the way that system works is really neat. So if you get a, a bloom report and you respond and go to collect water, you can collect that water then using a field portable uh, toxin extraction technology that Mbio has developed, you can take that whole water and you can extract all the toxins from the cells into the water. Then you can take that extract, you can apply it to this little black cartridge here with this anonymous hand is holding, um, and you can kind of see an idea right beneath here of what that cartridge will actually show, but you can add your extracted toxin sample to that cartridge and you place it into the machine and it takes about 10 minutes to read that uh, cartridge and will give you a, a quantitative value, which you can read through a laptop or a tablet, and it generates a report. Now, this is just an example report, it's not actual data. Then through this NOAA MERHAB project, working with our project, or working with our partners at Limnotech, we are developing an app where uh, citizen scientists and researchers who are collecting this data out in the field will be able to upload those data to a database right uh, almost in near real time. So we'll be able to not only collect data and know the toxin concentration in near real time, but we'll be able to upload it to a database which will uh, um, collect all of this information and allow Rick and his team to uh, you know, use these data in order to help inform future uh, toxin forecasts. So this is really neat. And this entire uh, process can be done in about 30 minutes from whole water to quantitative results. And because this is the first year of this three year project, we are um, going to validate all of these results using standard ELISA techniques, which many of our labs use, and LCMS MS analysis for these toxins. Um, and Greg Doucette in his lab at uh, NOAA NCOS on Charles King's going to be doing that for us. It's important to also point out that this system analyzes two toxins, microcystins, the toxins that caused the 2014 fleet of water crisis, and another you know, uh, toxin, Sundus bromopsin, 
um, which is uh, in emerging toxin, especially down in uh, the southeast U.S. So it can analyze both these toxins at the same time. Now, researchers, we can't be everywhere always. So we thought it was really important to partner with uh, citizen scientists from around the basin. So for this project, uh, our partners at Limnotech are going to be working with the Toledo and Port Clinton water treatment plant operators to utilize this technology within these water treatment plants. Uh, Justin Chaffin is going to incorporate some of this technology into his ongoing uh, Charitable Captain Toxin Monitoring Program, which he's been running since 2013. Uh, Tom Bridgman and his team at University of Toledo are going to be working with Maumee Bay State Park beach managers. And finally, uh, NOAA and BGSU are going to be collaborating uh, with uh, NOAA's Phytoplankton Monitoring Network, specifically at the Imagination Station in downtown Toledo and Old Woman Creek near site, um, which you can see here just uh, outside the Western Basin. So we are going to be able to not only link researchers with citizen scientists, but also integrate this rapid, easy to use portable toxin detection technology to help us expand our ability to monitor toxins in Western Lake Erie. And um, in order, uh, I just, so I, this is where I was gonna end my talk. So Chris, you're gonna have to indulge me in another minute, but I wanted to show a, a practical application of this. So yesterday morning, I received an email at 8 a.m. to, uh, you know, from a citizen um, in the Sandusky Bay region around Port Clinton. Um, and there's an excerpt from uh, this person's email basically saying, I'm seeing these blooms. Here are some, here's a picture from my dock. I'm seeing kids playing in the water where these blooms are. Can we have the water tested? Now, traditionally, we'd have to go there, collect the sample, bring it back to the lab, extract it, analyze it and then uh, return those data for potential management action. But instead, uh, using this technology, I was able to uh, send my graduate student, Seth, uh, to this location. Uh, with this technology, he was able to collect the sample, extract it, and analyze it on site. So we received the email at 8 a.m. He was on site by 11. And then by noon, we had on-the-spot data, which once it's laboratory validated, hopefully by the end of this project, um, this is not the actual data that we showed. Um, they can, you know, these data will be available for rapid management decisions which will help protect human health. So this just example highlights the potential this technology has for allowing us to rapidly evaluate uh, potential uh, harm of a bloom and be able to take management actions in near real time. But of course, as Rick said, if you see a scum, it's always best to avoid that scum. So I will stop there and thank you all for your time. And I'm happy to talk about any aspect of this project in more detail um, during the Q&A. Thanks, Tim. So uh, we'll move on to our next speaker. Uh, we have with us today Chris Schwartz, uh, he's the supervisor with Wood, Soil, Wood County Soil and Water Conservation District. I'm mean, really just going to give us a farm view of, of water quality efforts um, in Western Lake Erie Basin. So. Uh, Chris, you want to test your audio real quick? Yeah. Can you hear me, Chris? I can hear you and I can see your slides, so we're good to go. All righty. Hey, thanks. Uh, happy to be with you here today. Um, I'm farmed here in Wood County for 30 some years and been uh, involved in the soil and water efforts for just about that long. So, um, you know, last year was a crazy year up here. We had a lot of uh, acres go unplanted. Um, we did have less nutrients applied but uh, we had more tillage going on late summer, early fall. Uh, some of that was due to the fallow ground. Some of it was weed suppression. So our technicians documented that last year. Uh, we move into year 2020. Uh, we've had a more typical growing season, at least early on till now, till the, this dryness. Um, the bloom forecast still has farmers confused on, on which way we're going. Again, I believe uh, our tillage transects from our soil and water technicians are showing more tillage again this spring. And I, I think that kind of points to Laura's data that's showing more dissolved uh, phosphate in the, in the water. And I think uh, actually this spring, we probably had some catch up applications of nutrients where guys didn't get their fertility on in 2019, um, maybe loaded up a little more or had to catch up a little more. So we may have had a slight uptick or even more than that in fertilizer applied this spring. Um, what's good about what's going on in, in uh, 
water quality is uh, this group. It's the OACI, the Ohio Agricultural Conservation Initiative. Um, this group is uh, a group that has come together to work together on water quality issues and, and to certify uh, producers that they're doing some conservation efforts. It's also seeking to assess year-to-year -year adaptation of conservation real time so we can tell what differences are going on out in the field. Uh, I think for me, the encouraging part of this is this group, it's the first time all these groups have, have been on board all together working with one common goal. Um, we've always had our, our uh, separate goals and they've kind of co-aligned, but this group has been very cohesive and, and uh, you know, our, the farm groups are super excited to have the environmental councils and the Na nature conservancy sitting with the same table with them. Um, this group has worked really well with ODA promoting H2 Ohio. Um, we, uh, you know, H2 Ohio came out this winter. We we had some great sign up meetings. Uh, we brought in a lot of people that were really new to conservation into into soil and op water offices. Uh, we signed up more than 2,000 farmers in the initial roll rollout. Um, that covered 43% of the cropland in the watershed. And I know we've all stated that we need practices on a, a wide wide area of acres in the watershed. We, we can't get to our goal by just enrolling 15 or 20% or a few producers here and there in conservation practices. And I think that's been really encouraging to me. We've had some counties where over 50 and maybe 55% of the cropland was engaged in into a conservation program. Uh, that's just unheard of in the conservation world. You know, we're, we're lucky to get three to 5% enrollment in a county sometimes. So, uh, but we have the team behind it now with the OACI and ODA working together, and we have the vehicle and the resources with H2 Ohio. Um, why, why was H2 Ohio successful? Well simply because of the diversity of the groups promoting it and the practices that H2 Ohio allowed producers to use. Um, those practices encompass all kinds of farmers. You don't have to be a no-tiller. You can be a uh, conservation farmer or you can be a, a tillage farmer and make use of some of the H2 Ohio practices. It works for uh, guys who, who just grow crops, row croppers. It works for livestock guys. Um, Unfortunately, the pandemic really threw a, a wrench in that. We were really rolling with it. And then uh, the pandemic hit. So uh, 2020, those practices kind of went out the window. Um, there's a lot of farmers that were, are continuing with those practices, even though there wasn't any funding for that 2020. Uh, we're asking people to come back in right now to sign up for 2021. I think a big proportion or a large portion of those guys are gonna come back in uh, and we're going to focus, and that the foundation of H2 Ohio is the nutrient management plans, which I think we all realize are, are the foundation of everything. And uh, guys are going to have to have those approved, and you're not going to get a payment until your nutrient management plan is in place and the practice is is completed. And I think it shows, especially on the OAC, OAC side, that uh, farmers want want to participate in programs, and they're they're uh, open to uh, sharing their information as long as it doesn't come back to them. They, we like uh, that the OACI project aggregates stuff on a, on a watershed level. So what going on, what are, what are we thinking on? Um, we, we had a way better planting season, at least locally, but it's extremely dry right now. Um, Awareness and interest in camp conservation practices is, is very high. Uh, it's the highest I've seen in my 30 years of farming. And then it's encouraging that this winter, especially well, H2 Ohio signups are going on. Farmers generally talk about two things in the, in the winter, markets and weather. Well, con conservation was the topic at a lot of coffee shops and farmers trying to figure out how to make their conservation plans work in H2 Ohio. The first time I've really experienced that. Um, down the road, we're still going to need some financial incentives, especially for these practices like the subsurface placement and the newer incorporations that are really capital intensive. Um, we have a lot of economic stresses on the farms right now, uh, and there's just not a lot of money available to to uh, pay for some of these practices unless there's some incentive. I, I think most farmers would tell you that you know your break-even cost on 
growing an acre of corn or a bushel is, is $4 and we're in the $3 range right now. So I, I think uh, to expect farmers to, to take a risk and jump and invest in a lot of capital purchases at this time is, is just not likely without a program like H2 Ohio. So that, that's about all I have, Chris, and happy to answer any questions. Chris, that's great. Thank you for those, those thoughts um, from the agricultural perspective. That's great. Uh, we'll move on right now to Dr. Sandra Kosick-Sills. Uh, she's an environmental specialist with the Ohio Lake Erie Commission. Um, and then after that, I, I'll gauge the clock here. We got so many questions. I was going to give a kind of an overview presentation, but I might forego that to, to get to some of these questions. So Sandra, let's check your audio real quick, please. Uh, can you hear me? We've got it, and I see your slides. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, my name is Sandra kosek Sills of the Ohio Lake Erie Commission. I'm here today to talk to you about Ohio's actions to reduce nutrient contributions that are driving these harmful algal blooms. A uh, little bit about the commission. Uh, we are a state agency tasked to preserve Lake Erie's natural resources, to protect the quality of its waters and ecosystem, and to promote economic development of the region by ensuring the coordination of policies and programs pertaining to water quality, toxic substances, and coastal resource management. Commission agencies include Ohio EPA, Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Ohio Department of Agriculture, Ohio Department of Health, Ohio Department of Transportation, Ohio Development Services Agency, and five private citizen members appointed by the governor. And the commission also oversees the management of the Lake Erie Protection Fund. Under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, Annex 4, goals have been set to protect Lake Erie. Uh, these are the Annex 4 goals listed as ecosystem object objectives. Uh, the first one, reducing the harmful algal blooms, and the second one, to increase oxygen in the central basin. These objectives have been translated into pounds or metric tons of nutrient loads to be reduced, as uh, Laura was indicating in her talk. I'm not going to cover that in detail here, um, but these are described in the Ohio Domestic Action Plan 2020 and also in a report by the Annex 4 subcommittee, which is referenced in that document. Ohio, Michigan, and Ontario adopted these targets in 2015 which was ahead of the 2018 date that was listed for the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. This was done to support early action through the Western Basin of Lake Erie Collaborative Agreement. That agreement is where the dates of 2020 and 2025 come from uh, as, as date targets for these meeting, these meeting these goals. The governors and premier recommitted to the goals of the collaborative agreement in June 2019. And the big question that we're getting now is will Ohio meet its 2020 aspirational 20% phosphorus reduction target? So the increase in excess phosphorus loading into Lake Erie developed over many years and millions of acres, as was mentioned, as land and water management practices changed and the solution we feel will take some time. While we do believe the H2 Ohio initiative will begin to greatly reduce phosphorus loading once it is fully underway, other interventions implemented prior to H2 Ohio will not lead to the aspirational reduction target this year, as was apparent in uh, Laura Johnson's presentation. Through the H2 Ohio initiative, Ohio has undertaken an ambitious strategy to partner with farmers to implement best management practices to prevent nutrient loss from their farm fields and also to invest in wetlands restoration throughout the Maumee River watershed to capture additional nutrients. These projects need time to be rolled out and to show results. It remains uncertain whether these actions will result in immediate effects or if there's some lag time for nutrients already moving through the system to be removed. This is an area of ongoing research and unfortunately, I think uh, the, this summer, the beginnings of those research projects, I believe will be delayed until next year because of the pandemic. But we do have a couple of projects that are looking at that time scale. Despite these challenges, the new resources and focus provided by H2 Ohio should accelerate the progress being made towards achieving the Annex 4 and Ohio Domestic Action Plan goals for nutrient reduction and ultimately a healthier Lake Erie. In Ohio's Domestic Action Plan 2020, which is available on the Lake Erie Commission website, 
We are building on existing actions as well as adding new components that are part of the H2 Ohio initiative. There are four key action areas to highlight. The first is establishing science-based priorities for agricultural best management practices and state programs to support H2 Ohio efforts, as Chris was just discussing. Um, and then enhancing the ability of wetland restoration to remove nutrients and focus by Ohio DNR to restore and enhance wetlands for nutrient reduction as part of H2 Ohio. And then working with communities to offer H2 Ohio support for home sewage treatment system remediation. And lastly, to integrate the role of watershed planning at the local level for siting projects to reduce nutrients efficiently including a distribution of the load reduction throughout the Maumee River watershed based on the Ohio EPA nutrient mass balance method. Ohio's significant initiative to do this work is Governor DeWine's H2 Ohio program. The H2 Ohio initiative year one funding was left mostly intact as OBM found some one-time reductions in other areas to balance the state's general revenue fund and close FY 2020. Um, so of course, with the pandemic, uh, the state was not achieving the revenues that were originally projected. However, a significant amounts of the H2 Ohio funding had already been processed. And so these projects will continue to go forward. Um, so we had ODA ended up with actually $50 million because of that overwhelming response. Uh, significant efforts were put in to preserve the amount of funding that they had been given and in, uh, enhance it slightly. Some of the funding for ODNR that had not been already encumbered was rolled over into that and their Senate Bill 299 funding as well. Um, DNR still managed to uh, put out a significant amount of funding uh, for wetlands projects. And Ohio EPA also had a number of statewide infrastructure projects that were funded. So another question here, what's going to happen in year two under H2 Ohio? So the COVID-19 pandemic continues to impact Ohio and Ohioans in significant ways. The coronavirus has dramatically impacted our health, our healthcare systems, and our economy. This unprecedented impact on state revenues required us to come together to make over a billion dollars in changes to the final quarter of fiscal year 2020. The pandemic is not over and the impact on our economy and on Ohio's tax revenues continues as we began FY 2021 on July 1st of 2020. As we start this new fiscal year, OBM has made it clear that revenues will not be sufficient to maintain all of the state budget increases that were built into FY 2021 last year. There are a lot of budget discussions happening with new information coming in and as of today, we do not yet have more information on the year two funding for H2 Ohio. And Chris talked some about the agricultural um, BMPs, I'm just going to talk sort of about the big picture uh, view of it. Uh, these are the 10 conservation practices that were identified for H2 Ohio funding. Uh, we, they were selected because they're both cost effective and efficient at removing total phosphorus. Uh, we did not have sufficient data to evaluate practices only for the dissolved reactive phosphorus. These practices focus on total phosphorus, but their ability to also reduce DRP was factored in uh, to the selection process. And ODA is rolling out uh, their practices as mentioned. In order to participate in these programs, each farmer will need to first work with the county soil and water to create a nutrient management plan as was described. Um, the response was overwhelming. Uh, the original target was exceeded by 340%. Uh, that's our over 2,000 producers and over 1 million acres. And so ODA is working on revising the BMP program applications to reflect the delays due to the pandemic. Application revisions for these BMPs must be complete by August 14. Development of the voluntary nutrient management uh, plans is underway now. Uh, program participants who will submit a BMP and have a plan approved by the Soil and Water Conservation District Board of Supervisors are eligible for an incentive payment of $2 per acre for all acres included in the plan. 
Uh, BMP implementation for payment may begin as soon as this fall for operations that have approved BNMPs. Okay, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions. I also refer you to lakeerie.ohio.gov. There's a link there if you would like to take a look at the domestic action plan and also to H2 .ohio.gov, which has full information on the H2 Ohio program. Thank you, Sandra, for that. Um, so that, uh, for the most part, in uh, our speakers, again, if we have time or later, I will give some other highlights. Um, but we have tons of questions coming in and only 15 minutes left on the webinar. So I'm going to start rolling to these questions. As you're seeing on your screen now is the headshots of the uh, speakers that spoke with us today and then um, their contact information. Please know that this, uh, this webinar is being recorded. We will provide the PowerPoints, and if you need an interview with any of these individuals on the screen, either contact them directly or, or work through Jill Gentis Benicki um, that is on this, this call. Um, so moving forward, I'm gonna try and hit some of Blake's questions first, because I know he's got to drop off right at noon, but I'm told that the WebEx will not shut down at noon, so if people are patient and want to stick on, um, we'll be happy to try and answer as many of these questions as we can. Um, so looking through here, let's see um, if I can grab some questions out of here. Um, Chris, I am available beyond noon. Oh, great, Blake, That's, that makes better because then I don't have to um, pick through these to find the one specifically to you. Um, so is the fraction of the microsystem containing uh, genes to produce the actual toxins being monitored? So many of you may not know when when the cyanobacteria are blooming, not all of them have the genetic makeup to actually produce the toxin. And so I guess the question is, is the percentage of that population capable of producing toxins increasing through time? And I think, Tim, you might be the one that can take the first cut at that. Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a great question. Um, right now, that's, a, that's to be determined. We do see seasonal shifts in the microcystis community because you know whether or not cells are able to produce toxin they're morphologically identical so we can't tell underneath the microscope which can or cannot uh, produce toxins um, within the microcystis uh, genus so we do tend to see the bloom start off um, with higher ratios of toxic to uh, non-toxic microcystis cells and that decreases throughout the year but if you're looking at you know, seasonal increases um, in the proportion, or at least annual increases in that proportion of toxic to non-toxic strains, uh, that does vary year to year. Um, there has been some research that has indicated that toxic strains will fare uh, better under uh, warmer conditions than non-toxic strains, uh, but they may produce less toxin per cell. So we still might see, uh, you know, ratios of toxic and non-toxic cells uh, increase, um, even though they're producing less toxin per cell, we're still going to see more toxin in these blooms. So it is forecasted, or at least it is thought that uh, climate change is going to not only make these uh, blooms uh, larger, last longer, but also potentially be more toxic. Thank you for that, Tim. Um, coming on to the next question, and I, Chris, I think you'll be able to take a crack at this. We're getting a lot of questions coming in related to CAFOs or, or animal operations. So uh, two questions that I'm going to try and combine um, multiple questions. But one is, how do these um, animal operations tie into nutrient management plans, um, those being funded through H2 Ohio and, and, and Department of Ag, and, and also, um, just kind of the, the questions are coming in, how serious is this problem? What information do we have of, of the percent contribution from these types of, of, of farming operations? So Chris, if you could feel okay. the best of your ability. Yeah, um, you know, most CAFOs are, are large animal feeding operations do have some type of nutrient management plan. A lot of times it's, it's a CNMP uh, that hold down to some standards. Uh, I think most, guys that treat their manure as an asset are doing a great job. Um, it, it's a valuable part of a fertility program on a farm. So I, I think people that are using that like that are doing a great job. I think uh, H2 Ohio entices these guys to do an even better job because it will only allow uh, manure applications to be paid for 
on uh, some farms that are probably traditionally not getting manure with less uh, less phosphate test levels on them. It's going to in, induce people to take manure to non-traditional fields and apply it earlier in the season when runoff in those and it's is less. So um, I, I think for the C CAFOs, using the H2 Ohio program is actually going to be beneficial for them and for the state in the water. Thanks for that, Chris. And, I, and I'll just add that there are some projects being funded now through the Ohio Department of Higher Education so under uh, Chancellor Gardner um, that are looking at um, different ways to apply phosphorus um, nutrients using manure, also just looking at the mobility of, of applications of manure relative to mobility of, of commercial fertilizers. So there's a lot of work still going on in, in this area. So thank you for that, um, that comment back. Um, I will come back to, um, and, it, and it ties into everything we've really been talking about here, but how do, how do we see if uh, people are not applying on legacy fields? So that question keeps coming up is this idea of um, if we have a legacy field, do we know if, if, if uh, producers are still applying fertilizers on those locations? And I, I just want to point back to, again, the, the nutrient management plan. So it's important for these um, producers, if they, if they can, and, and get help in doing so, develop these nutrient management plans so we're not um, adding more fertilizers to those, um, to those fields. Uh, there is a question here, and I don't know who on our panel. It might be you again, Chris. There's questions about have we seen um, over the years changes in phosphorus availability in the commercial products that are on the market, so in fertilizers on the market? Can, can someone speak to that, please? Yeah, I will, Chris. Um, I don't really think the availability of the of the phosphate inside commercial fertilizers has changed a bunch. Um, years ago, we used to use rock phosphate that was slightly less available, but I believe most of the current commercial fertilizers have their uh, availability has been the same for for since I've been farming anyway. So I don't think that's changed at all. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, this question may be better for Laura or Rick. Um, do we think the unusual weather conditions um, will cause the predictions um, to be underestimated? Um, that's the one. And do we see algal blooms um, take off in the inland lakes? So are we seeing more inland lake, um, and, and Blake, you maybe I'll answer this too, are we seeing more inland lake have harmful algal bloom occurrences? On, on temperature, this is Rick, on the temperature, what that does is get the bloom to start earlier, but it, the bloom is limited by the nutrient availability. So once it runs out of phosphorus um, or it has used up all the phosphorus available, it won't grow further. Uh, we did see two years ago, it was extremely warm starting Memorial Day and bloom started quite early, um, but it didn't get, uh, it didn't change our ultimate forecast. And the other side I should add in, depending on what happens in uh, September and October, it can go the other way. So we've had a couple of years where the fronts have come through in September and, and broken up the bloom early as well. So, Rick, so, thanks for that. And so to summarize some of that, because uh, you, you were breaking up a little again, the volume was a little low, but uh, basically the, the, the temperature can bring the onset of the bloom earlier and extend it longer, but really if the phosphorus isn't there during those time periods, that, that's really what dictates uh, the size of those blooms. But the temperature the of the bloom is dictated by phosphorus, yes, not by temperature. Thank you. Thank and you. as far as the inland lakes, uh, that's a whole, um, uh, that depends on all the factors that drive the bloom in any one of those lakes, which can be spring runoff. There's also internal loading. Every lake is different when you get to the inland lakes. Great. We have a question about the extent that the HABs have occurred in the central or eastern basins of Lake Erie. So either Sandra or Laura or Rick, if you want to talk about the bloom occurrence in, in, in the central and eastern basins, please. I could start that. Um, eastern basin, uh, we have not seen blooms in the eastern basin. Um, there are blooms that form in Presque Isle Bay. Those are locally generated. The central basin, um, two types of blooms. There's one in the central basin that sometimes appears in early July for about one to two weeks. And that's a completely different organism um, called Dilichospermum. And it, um, it's locally generated. 
uh, in the central basin. Again, it only lasts for a couple of weeks. Uh, sometimes it can be pretty severe, but like one year it might be in Ontario, the next year not present, next one on Ohio. Um, after some of the storms in the summer, a big thunderstorm, there may be local blooms that form uh, near shore inside what's called the thermal bar. So within about a mile of shore, the water is warm and it doesn't mix well. And sometimes you'll get these, um, a bloom right in an area um, within a week or so after a thunderstorm um, has brought in rainfall runoff. Those are local and they last for a relatively short time. Otherwise, central basin, the western part, the western basin bloom sometimes blows over there. So, yes, it's complicated, but or <laughs> there's many factors. But the short one is there's not persistent long-term blooms in the central western, the central or eastern basin. Thanks for that, Rick. Anybody else on the panel want to want to jump in on that? And not hearing anything. A quick one, Blake, for you actually. Does Cyan App serve lakes in Canada? Uh, we've wor been working with Karen Binding at Environment Canada um, to make sure that we're trying to match up. Canada will be hosting, I believe, their own imagery going forward. We do cross um, some of the lower portions of Canada and those to get posted on, on, in the app but our focus at the moment is not to include Canada. So the lower lakes, yes, uh, but then I would recommend going to Environment Canada and talking to Karen Binding about their imagery. Thank you for that, Blake. Uh, Tim, I'm gonna turn to you for a couple here uh, real quick off the bat. Um, one is the cost for MBIO, that field portable system. So people are looking for an estimated cost when it rolls out. Um, and then also, um, are there any water conditions that may affect the methods or the accuracy of the MBIO? So cost and then things that might be going in the water when you go out and take a sample that might affect the accuracy. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, so uh, the first, um, it's it's going to be about uh, $5,200 for the uh, the algae lice, the portable extraction, and the, and the reader. Um, so that's the upfront cost. Uh, along, you know, with the tablet, um, but we've been able to use tablets that are $250. So um, very, you know, relatively inexpensive when it comes to uh, equipment, uh, for science anyway. Um, and then each sample costs about $22 to analyze. So each cartridge costs about $22. So, um, you know, obviously a relatively low cost per cartridge um, once you have the initial investment. When it comes to uh, water conditions and uh, you know, overall just field conditions of heat, um, humidity, uh, et cetera. That's one of the reasons why we're, we're testing this unit in uh, Lake Erie as, as a test bed with, with citizen scientists is because we want to understand so those, those limitations, right? Because this is no technology is the ultimate technology. Every, everything has limitations. And the idea is to work um, to understand what those limitations are. Uh, so that's why, you know, all the samples that we'll be collecting will be validated using um, you know, uh, EPA validated methods, the uh, uh, ELISA method, as well as LCMSMS. So, uh, you know, we not only are there water, you know, and field conditions, but there are also, you know, different uh, types of microcystin. There are over 240 different types of microcystin. So we need to look at how different, you know, congeners of microcystin, um, different ratios of those uh, congeners uh, impact the accuracy, but that's the reason why we are conducting the study that we are conducting now. Great questions. Yep, no, thanks for that, Tim. So we're looking at two minutes before um, noon. So again, we are going to keep this up because we've got tons of questions. So if you want to stay on board and listen to the questions, but I didn't want to lose the opportunity to thank our, our um, six speakers that we've had today, but also to thank, uh, again, our, our three congressional um, speakers at the beginning of the event. And again, the numerous people from uh, both state and uh, our state and federal elected officials and our agencies that are on this call. Um, it's been a pleasure during my career to see this increased level of communication between the academic institutions and the state agencies um, and, the, and the producers and the, and the NGOs. I think there's a, just a, a great level of communication that's happening across the, the Western Basin of Lake Erie and I, I would argue throughout Ohio. Um, so I wanted to make sure that that was out there. And again, Ohio Sea Grant's uh, happy to host this, but I, I cannot um, go by without thanking a lot of our partners um, that we that we get to interact with 
um, within NOAA and, and not only the National Center for Ocean Coastal Science, but we get to interact with NOAA Glarel. And so there's just a ton of people um, that are at the table when we do this. Uh, and so the, Ocean, the Office of Ocean and Atmospheric Research with Brooke Carney and Margaret Lansing, NOAA Public Affairs with Jerry Slapp um, and, and, and uh, Jenny Lyons, uh, NOAA Legislative Affairs and, and Mike Jarvis, um, Ruth Kelty and Sierra Sarkis with the uh, National Ocean Services. So it takes many hands to, to make sure that this forecast goes on. So I wanted to give that plug for anybody that might have to drop off. But if, if our speakers don't mind, I'm going to keep plugging through um, some of these questions um, and see if we can get at this. So um, sorry, we have a, I'm just trying to read through some of these questions that are coming in really quickly. It's difficult to keep up. Um, one second, folks. Sorry about that. Um, looking at uh, toxicity, um, so any, do any of the models look at producing toxic blooms? So the models that are in the ensemble, um, I will add, and Tim Davis referenced it, um, EcoHab. So there is a grant, again, a NOAA-funded grant um, led by uh, OSU Stone Lab, but has many partners on it that is actually trying to get that toxicity prediction um, out next forecast. So the goal is when we give the forecast next year, not only will we give the size of that, but we will likely give a level of toxicity. And this ties to some of the other questions coming in that I'm seeing is, is questions about nitrogen. And so clearly we've now started to learn what role nitrogen plays in toxicity. And so a lot of the uh, experiments that are going on um, to help build this toxicity forecast are, are looking at that nitrogen level in the system. And so uh, to answer those questions, yes, there should be a toxicity prediction um, coming, and it is highly um, uh, dependent on nitrogen levels in the system. Uh, I, let me add on that, Chris. The, the first part is to get to getting to toxicity as we go through the season. Um, the, a particular challenge will be, can we actually forecast how toxic the bloom will be when it starts, which is another challenge. And that's going to take a little more work to get there. But we're very close to the other point, which is the toxicity does change over time, and it changes around the lake. And we're, we're, we should be getting very close to the ability to say how toxic it will be next week or the week after. Thank you for that addition. Uh, another question I see coming in here, is any work to study nutrient requirements for current crops with the aim of tightening recommendation ranges? And so, Chris, I'm sure you can add on to this. but. I will contribute that Steve Coleman at OSU, Ohio State University, with many collaborators, has uh, taken a look at those, what are called the tri-state fertilizer recommendations. Um, and, and a lot of that work that's coming back is saying that those levels are, are, are appropriate levels. Um, and so the science that we're doing now confirms some of those. But Chris, is there anything you would like to add to those tri-state crop recommendations? I, you know, I, I think, uh, like you said, Chris, some of the research is, is confirming that those levels are appropriate and what we need to be at. And, uh, you know, the H2 Ohio nutrient management plans are going to hold uh, producers to follow those tri-state guidelines, which I think it, if, once everybody starts looking at is going to move us along our way to our goal. Thank you for that, that addition. Um, so the question, um, again, maybe for you, Chris or Laura, is why would tillage in Ohio portion of Western Lake Erie Basin be up last year and this year compared to previous years? I thought practices around tillage would typically be more sustained on a given farm. Uh, I'll jump right in there. I think uh, the large percent of uh, prevent plant last year uh, created a bunch of the extra tillage. Uh, people could not control the weeds, so I think people tilt them to, to take care of them. And then uh, I think partially, uh, you know, farmers, it, it, I think it's a psychological thing when you have a bad crop or a bad experience or a bad looking field, tilling it under kind of relieves some of that stress or, or you don't have to look at it. So I think we probably had some more recreational tillage than we've had in prior years. I would look for the uh, tillage trend to go back to where we were and to have a much larger proportion of no-till for the 2021 crop than we had in the 2020 crop. Thank you for that addition, Chris. That was great. Um, for that right now, I'm seeing um, most of these questions have 
either directly been addressed, they were coming in while the talks were going on, either been addressed um, during the talks or, or have been addressed during these questions. Um, so what I'm actually going to do, seeing that we still have um, roughly 300 people, 250 people still on the call, um, Christina, if you could uh, allow me to share screens, I think some of the other thing that could be addressed from some of these questions is the PowerPoint presentation um, that I had prepared. Hey, Chris, while you, uh, while you yeah. transition there, could I just make one real quick comment, um, just so I'm ob obligated to? Um, just on the, you know, on the questions regarding nitrogen, you know, and toxicity. So the, the microcystin molecule itself, right, it, um, it directly needs nitrogen, right? It's, it's a very nitrogen rich molecule. So when folks are coming and asking about those questions, you know, we, we need to, we know that phosphorus plays a big role in the size of the bloom, but nitrogen, especially throughout the season, plays a large role in how toxic that biomass will be. And my work by myself and Justin and, and others around the basin um, have really showed that in this lake and, and other systems. So it's that interaction between nitrogen and, and phosphorus, um, both, you know, pre-bloom and during the bloom is really, you know, important in how, uh, you know, large the bloom will be um, and also how toxic that that biomass will be during the bloom. So that's a really important point to make that it's a it's a it's a N and P uh, problem, even though we we focus primarily on P for the for the forecast. Thank you very much for that addition, Tim, and that uh, extra detail. So again, I'm just going to kind of roll through um, some numerous collaborative efforts, and, and I can't stress this enough. Um, this plan was already mentioned earlier, so the Clean Lake uh, 2020 plan. Uh, this was funding that uh, Sandra Kosick Stills mentioned was also being used to support the uh, efforts of the Ohio Department of Higher Education or uh, Ohio Department of Ag. Um, but some of this funding also went to purchase sensors that are being deployed in the Maumee River watershed and also um, to build a what's called a mesocosm and a flex lab at Stone Laboratory up on the island. For those of you who don't know, mesocosm are basically huge flow through tanks. Uh, we imagine that these tanks will be used. We've seen asks um, from researchers across multiple universities to have access to these flow through systems where large experiments can be can be run. Um, if you were able to be on a, on a webinar that was uh, hosted, I think Thursday of last week um, about H2 Ohio efforts, uh, it was mentioned that uh, the wetland monitoring associated with those wetlands building being built, constructed under H2 Ohio is being developed by a group called LEARN. If you're not familiar with that, LEARN stands for the Lake Erie and Aquatic Research Network. This is a large network of universities across Ohio and, and some outside of Ohio. And the goal of LEARN is basically to bring the expertise that exists across our state to bear on these problems. And so what this group is doing right now with weekly meeting is to develop a protocol on how we would monitor um, nutrient reductions associated with this wetland work. Um, as Director Merch mentioned on that webinar and, and some staff from ODNR is that this protocol once developed will be vetted so that other people have the opportunity uh, to weigh in. I did want to give a plug for the uh, Understanding HABs State of the Science event. Usually this is held face-to-face -face in the Stranahan Theater in Toledo, but because of COVID, it will be virtual. Please visit the Ohio Sea Grant website to see um, how to register for that. It will be on September 2nd. Uh, we've already talked about EcoHab. That's what uh, Tim Davis just referenced. This is the effort to look at the toxicity uh, forecasting of these blooms. Again, multi-university collaboration led um, by one university, in this case, OSU. Cannot forget to mention there is an NIH NSF funded um, center, so the Great Lakes Center for Fresh Waters and Human Health. Uh, this is led at BGSU, but again, multi-university and even in this case, uh, agency collaboration as we work our way through addressing nutrient and, and, and bloom dynamics. Um, out of UT, UT's Lake Erie Center, so led by UT, again, multiple universities and agencies involved, though, uh, basically the Lake Erie open water have impairment criteria. So led by Tom Bridgman, uh, UT is bringing together a team that's being able to assess how you would accurately sample surface waters to know what levels of um, blooms are present and, and also the level of toxicity. Cannot go without talking about the Great Lakes Observing System, GLOSS. Um, they currently have an Ohio, or I'm sorry, an Ocean Tech Transfer Grant. Um, this is a collaboration again with the Cleveland Water Alliance, Limnotech, and, and others. Basically, it's a it's a HABs early warning um, system, um, and so basically they're using 
um, models and in-lake sensors to basically send um, text messages to people that sign up for the service to, to let them know that the conditions in the lake are changing. Um, a, a, a draft of that product went out in uh, 2019, and the responses from that prototype were very positive. Um, that is going back into the machine and is being polished and, and will be uh, reassessed. Um, again, that warning system and the, and the integration of data at the end of this year, and hopefully a final product will be rolled out early in 2021. Citizen science was mentioned quite a bit, uh, especially under Tim Davis's talk, but the Cleveland Water Alliance is a key player in this too. The Cleveland Water Alliance has been bringing um, industry across Ohio, academics and citizens together to test um, some great tech and how uh, the citizens can be out there um, doing uh, monitoring work. Uh, some of the questions that did come in that I wanted to address is, is what role is, is our Canadian counterpart playing in this? And one thing I wanted to highlight is uh, the U.S. and Canadian cooperation on HABs through what's called Rayon. So Rayon is the uh, real-time aquatic ecosystem observing network. And so with Rayon, basically it's using the technology that exists across agencies and academic universities and making sure that that technology is shared. And, and leverage to make sure we have the, the best results coming out of the work we're doing. And last but not least in this is uh, Ohio Department of Higher Education funding the Harmful Algal Bloom Research Initiative. So this has been $2 million approximately of funding every year since 2015. Um, it's co-managed by uh, Ohio Sea Grant and the University of Toledo. And basically this is our effort to go to the agencies and ask what research questions they need to have answered to better manage the system. Um, we are happy to report that we have 12 new projects that will, um, we're supposed to start um, spring of this year, but COVID kind of slowed those down. Um, 12 new projects that are going on um, right now, but also we have funding in FY20 and FY21 to be doing new calls for proposals. So Toledo and Sea Grant will be meeting with the state agencies to identify proposals for the next research projects to be funded. Um, so that's all I had for updates there. I am now going to actually, again, go back and look at some of the questions that we have, but I didn't want to go without talking about just Ohio is in an amazing place with the support we're seeing from our governor through H2Ohio and all the communication that exists between our, our research institutions and, and, our, uh, and our state agencies. Um, one of the questions that came in kind of pertinent to what I discussed, how are research efforts monitoring the potential of construction wetlands um, to become nutrient sources rather than sinks over the long term? Um, so yeah, I mean, that is that is the effort, is to make sure we're not just going out and, and sampling the water um, running through these wetlands or associated with these wetlands, but also to look at the soils in these wetlands. How are they holding on to the, the, the nutrients? When do they release them? How are they releasing them? We're actually going to be pulling in scientists that are hydrologists. And for those of you that are not familiar with that term, it's looking at not only flow over the surface, but how does groundwater interact with these wetlands? And so I can tell you that the, the academics from six or seven different institutions, Kent, Akron, Toledo, Wright State, Bowling Green, um, are sitting together and talking about how to address this runoff. Um, so whether these wetlands are sources or sinks, and also when these pulses of nutrients might come in, if they do at all. And also things like lag time. We're hoping that when we build these wetlands, they have a, a quick impact on nutrient contributions, but there is a strong possibility that there will be a delayed effect on, on how these wetlands um, behave. And so uh, this monitoring protocol will, um, I assure you, be very robust and, and, and vetted through the, the proper um, channels with our state agencies and other academics. I'm seeing we still have 219 um, attendees on, so this is phenomenal. Um, while I look for other questions, I would ask anybody that is on our panel, our speakers, if they want to augment any of the comments that I made about the numerous collaborative efforts going on. Um, is it possible, one question I'm getting, is it possible to differentiate between DRP from fertilizers and that that is contributed from manure? Anyone on our panel want to take a first cut at differentiating DRP from fertilizer and manure? Hey, this is Laura. I can talk about that a little bit. 
Um, yeah, so technically, no. I mean, the phosphorus that comes from manure is the same as phosphorus that comes from fertilizer, um, which is why we should try and use that in a more um, smart manner. We can be better about using manure and making sure it's getting to fields that need more phosphorus so they can reduce their commercial fertilizer input and thereby reduce the amount of phosphorus that's being applied in the watershed in general. However, with that, we're trying really hard to use other ways of being able to fingerprint that phosphorus. And so I've been, um, I had a project where I worked with uh, Kevin McClooney at Bowling Green to try and use oxygen isotopes to see, you know, if we can use those oxygen isotopes to better understand where that phosphorus was coming from and then also how much it's processed by the time we measure it by the, at the end of the watershed. Um, and that, that research is still ongoing and progressing. Um, so far it's, you know, basically sort of indicating that you can sort of see signals here and there of like human effluent, but it's a little bit more difficult um, to differentiate the manure versus commercial fertilizers. But on the flip side, the other person on that project was Paula Mauser, who's now in New Hampshire, and she was basically using more complicated organic structures to be able to fingerprint that phosphorus and did so fairly well. Um, and the main finding being that what we found at the end of the watershed basically looked at almost identical to what comes off of a typical edge of field site rather than some um, any of the different manures or effluents. However, those samples were collected from the manure pits themselves, not after application onto fields. And I know that she's been working with Bob Midden also at BGSU on research to better um, to ref better refine that technique so we can use it um, a little bit more confidently. Um, what we can say about phosphorus from manure, like we can tell how much, you know, we have a, we can estimate how much is being applied in the watershed. We can look at differing amounts that are being applied across other sub-watersheds to be able to better ascertain its effects, um, or we look at soil test levels. And Laura, thank you for that. Any other thoughts from the panel? I have a question from uh, John Bratton with uh, Limnotech. Uh, so Laura or Rick, is there any evidence that the timing of the load makes a difference to bloom size? So basically we haven't seen any substantial P since late May. So this does this reduce availability? That's question one. And then also this idea of hot weather has made Lake Erie really, really warm. So uh, is it now too hot perhaps? So um, the pulse of when the nutrients come in and, and, and a, a discussion about temperature in the lake and blooms. Uh, I could probably take that on the answer temperature is they like it hot. So um, uh, whatever 80 degrees uh, will make my microcystis quite happy. So we're, um, I don't think Lake Erie can get hot enough to be a, it won't get hot enough to be a problem. The timing uh, from past years, uh, we don't see that. Um, 2011, which is kind of a distant memory, but um, most of that all fell between March and May, and there was no June and July low. And 2009 also was pretty much March and April. So it's, uh, there's some indication that the July ones make a, a high load in July has a bit more impact, not surprising, but um, pretty much the nutrients managed to stay in the system. So that timing, we don't, we, I don't expect to see uh, much of a difference this time. Rick, thanks for that. You kind of blinked in and out, so I'm going to really high level. Is, is July definitely is a, is a, a big contributor, the loads that come in in July? Yeah, July? July can be a factor if there's a large load, but this year there won't be. And it doesn't, um, uh, the early loads, uh, March, April, May, we saw those in 2009 and 11. And 11, of course, was a very large bloom. So. Um, the, the loads pretty much stay in the, the phosphorus stays in the lake. It gets cycled through the spring bloom, and there's been a pretty active spring bloom, and it keeps it keeps it there in the western basin. So um, I don't expect there that we've not seen any evidence that the timing, um, the fact that the water comes in in March or April or May, March, April, May, makes a difference. So I, I can add a little bit to that as well. You know, um, on the river side, you know. For dissolved phosphorus, we don't really see a huge difference between the timing of the loads. Like if it rains early in the spring, we tend to get, you know, similar storm flow or you know, basically storm concentrations as we get later. Sometimes we get a little bit higher concentrations um, after 
maybe any of the startup fertilizer had been applied, but nothing that drastic. Um, but what does change is particulate phosphorus runoff. And so one of the hypotheses I had for this year until that May storm event was that, well, all of our rain happened in, in March and April, and we tend to get more particulate loss earlier in the season before before there's a growing crop or growing um, good filter scripts and stuff like that in the ground. And, and then we got May, and then the concentrations are still just as high. So I was like, oh, well, that's not the issue here. But that play a role in the differences that we see in particulate phosphorus between 2011 and 2015, which is kind of interesting. Thank you for that, Laura. Uh, I do have a question in here related to, do, do we see or have we been studying any impacts on sport and commercial, commercial fishing? So I, I can speak a, a little to this. There was some funding under the Ohio Department of Higher Education, and, and, and the, clearly in Ohio, the DNR, the Department of Health, and EPA have been looking at this. Um, the current recommendations um, from what's posted is, is if you're following the normal consumption advisories that exist for fish in Lake Erie, um, so uh, again, look at that, how many meals per week. Um, when, when um, if concentrations are detected, they're at such little amounts that you're, if you're following those existing consumption advisories for other toxicants in the lake, um, like, you know, mercury, you, uh, you should be uh, okay to eat those fish. Um, Rick, question for you. Is there a historical record of severity of HABs prior to 2002? I think this is coming because usually when we plot that severity index, uh, it goes back to 2002. Uh, the type of satellite data changes before 2002, and um, there has been one study with Landsat data, which goes back to the 80s. Uh, the good part is the Landsat does go back to the 80s. The difficult is there's only a few images each summer, so it's, it's potentially hit or miss on getting the blooms. Uh, it generally shows the pattern of yellow blooms. Rick, you can try and project too at the end here, Rick. There's generally a uh, pattern of blooms in the mid 80s, but that's it. Uh, there, it's difficult to get the same quality data because the, the the satellite, the high quality satellites, are recent. Thank you. Um, so this again, a question about what is the interplay of, of particulate to dissolve phosphorus and vice versa. Just wanted to revisit. We do have some research being funded right now. It's in that pulse of new projects funded under Ohio Department of Higher Education to look at that movement of phosphorus from a particulate phase to a dissolved phase. And um, we could also tell you that there is some great research on that's being started to look at the rivers as more than just pipes that carry water from the land to the lake. Um, so we're starting to look at, do the rivers themselves contribute phosphorus to the system? So are we getting, you know, sloughing off or erosion from the banks or is there phosphorus being released from the from the river sediments. Um, so a lot of that work is going on now. So again, we're in an exciting time when we're starting to see um, more answers to a lot of the questions that we keep seeing about phosphorus and phosphorus uh, movement. Yeah, and I, and I can add to that, Chris, um, that, you know, there's, there's like, as you were saying, but to make it super clear, there's two different types of sediments and particles that we're talking about. You know, there is this interesting factor of, are the particulates that are in the storm flow, like during an event, either releasing or, or absorbing phosph dissolved phosphorus that's in the water column, and then that thereby changing essentially what ultimately gets delivered to the lake. And then there's the flip side is what are the sediments that are already in the system, like on the bottom or, or ditch or in the bank. And both of those probably act very similarly, but they're going to be acting potentially in different areas of the water and at different times. Laura, thank you for that addition. Um, I am seeing a question here. It says, once the total maximum daily loads or these um, inputs of both uh, total phosphorus and DRP um, are reached, how long do we expect before we might see a, you know, a change in, in the blooms? Um, I will start here, but I definitely want to hear Rick and, and, and Laura weigh in on this. When we see DRP and TP loads that hit the Annex 4 target, 
those are blooms that are the size that we are hoping to get to or hoping to achieve. So what it says is if it, we're seeing all that evidence, it says if we hit these our Annex 4 targets, the bloom will be at the, at the state that we're hoping to get. Um, so many people think that, oh, even if we hit those loads, it'll take many years for the lake to recover. Um, that's not the case. Um, and this can also be seen when Rick says that many of these models um, don't take how big the bloom was in the previous year to predict how big it'll be in the current year. And so our biggest biggest hurdle here or lift here is to get to the 40 percent reduction or the the target loads not necessarily just the, 40 loads, the target loads consistently from year to year despite what the weather is despite whether wet or dry conditions um, that is the heavy lift if we can get there consistently we will consistently see blooms of the size that we would consider acceptable rick or did i misspeak in any way there or, or any clarification needed Sounds great. Yeah, uh, the clarification I would have is, you know, yeah, right now, yeah, we, there doesn't seem to be that much of a legacy. So, you know, like all of the environmental talk we always have always just seems so downtrodden. So, like, this is a little bit of of hope that we can have at the end of our tunnel that if we reach these loads, it'll actually, or you know, actually have the effect on the lake that we want it to have, and hopefully that'll be sustained into the future. Yeah, we get the phosphorus to stick to the fields. Yeah. And, it does, um, and, we, and we have enough data to show that if, if it doesn't go into the river, we will see an, uh, a definite change in the size of the bloom. So we can just get the, get the, which is what the farmers would want. They don't want to fertilize Lake Erie either. So that we, we've gone a half an hour over. I'm still seeing 168 attendees. That's phenomenal. But I, I do want to be, um, you know, kind with your time here. So what we will do, just to reiterate, this has been recorded. It'll be accessible on our um, Ohio Sea Grant webpage. The PowerPoints will also show up there. If anybody on this, um, the attendees want to reach out to any or all of the speakers, you're seeing their headshots and, of course, their emails. And I did see in the chat function, um, that there was a link to the registration for the um, HABS State of the Lake event that, again, will be virtual, not at the Strand of Hand. So, again, virtual, and that's set to be on September 2nd. Uh, that registration link will show you all the current uh, lineup of speakers. So there'll be a set of an all-day event starting at, I can't remember now, usually 8.30 and going to 4 or 5. There'll be a morning um, session and an afternoon session with a break around lunch. So please um, log on to that. I see that the, in the chat function, that URL is there right now. And I also want to thank people. I've seen a lot of thank yous to our panelists and speakers coming across the chat function. So um, if everybody could just give a virtual round of applause to our, our six speakers. And, and again, the, the tremendous engagement that we've seen from our elected officials, um, our agencies, and our industry partners. And so with that, I will um, sign off. You will see that there is a URL now posted that has a, a survey. Uh, for this webinar. Uh, so we continue to have not only Laura and Rick speak every year, but also try and line up some speakers that we think would be of interest for attendees. So please fill out that survey. Um, if you have any suggestions for next year's guest speakers, feel free. Um, and again, thanks for uh, all the collaboration across the state of Ohio and our neighboring states.